Alrighty. All right. So uh, it feels like a lifetime since the last time I've done one of these. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, if it feels the same for you, but I feel like I've been away for too long. Man. So as the title suggests here, I titled today's Shotgun Saturday, Lifts You Like a Feather. And admittedly, as I mentioned this morning, I had a, a pretty interesting dream, which I'm not going to talk about that, by the way. And uh, I'm sure for the folks that are interested in lucid dreaming and all that, um, I could probably weave that into another Twitter space of another topic outside of trading, but it's going to be outside the scope of today. But admittedly, it was a, a heavy influence today. Because I thought, I, thought I thought about basically, you know, what is it I want to talk about going into this weekend? Yeah, you know, I thought about this entire week. I wanted to come up with something that was uh, engaging. I wanted to have something that would be helpful, impactful, and try to promote some kind of, uh, well, performance some kind of uh, improvement, some clarity, that type of discussion today. And a, a lot of the questions I saw that were coming to me to my video section, where the, the video section comments area are open, uh, a lot of people asked, like, how do I know when not to trade? And... Could I talk a little bit about that? And what are the things that help pinpoint those things for you as a student are trying to learn what it is I'm teaching and hopefully try to adopt some of the mindset things that I've acquired over the years that help me to mainly avoid losing, where as a younger man, I was more prone to losing jumping into these environments. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. But Understand that it's normal for you as a, as a trader, as someone that's new, trying to learn how to do this, to feel like you have to do it all the time. Otherwise, it feels counterproductive. And it seems counterintuitive that you should try to learn how to trade to learn how to trade less. But that's, in fact, what you should do. And it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel that way because of the way the industry is built around commission-based activity, uh, get everyone trying to get a piece of the, the action. And you have educators that are trying to sell you something, and I used to be one of them. Uh, you have brokerage firms that want to charge you commissions and fees. Uh, you have services and softwares that want to try to get a butt of the action as well. And all of those things all those outside influences, they're all going to get paid before you do. Just like a job, tax man cometh. <laughs> you, can't, you can't escape it, okay? No matter how much money you have, you, some way, shape, or form, if you're buying something or if you're selling something, if you're acquiring something or running a business, uh, to some degree, you're going you're gonna to pay something in taxes. But in the pursuit of profitable, consistently profitable trading, the common denominator is avoiding overexposure and overleveraging. Now, overexposure and overleveraging, it's not me amplifying the same thing. It's two different things here. Overexposing yourself and your account to risk is not the same thing as overleveraging. Okay? So to eliminate the overleveraging point of it, because it's easier to do that and shorter, overleveraging is simply adding more contracts than you should be willing to take or that you should be allowed to do because there's an exorbitant amount of risk associated with trading more contracts. And a perfect example would be, uh, I'll just use the prop firm models because they unfortunately are guilty of this. Allowing 15 contracts for $150,000 combine or whatnot and only offer you amount of pseudo leverage 
or that leverage, but the drawdown before they take away the ability to trade that combine or account. Um, it's disproportionate. It, it shouldn't be allowed. And I think that that is one of the things that should be cleaned up. If you're going to see the prop firm industry continue, I think that they should be more realistic. If they're really in, in it to help you win, they shouldn't allow you to blow your own brains out because if it's their model to try to coax you into doing it properly and trade like a professional, professionals don't trade with 15 contracts when they're only allowed to lose, you know, a couple thousand dollars. It, it just, it just completely flies in the face of sound logic. So over leveraging is not what I'm talking about when I say overexposing. So over leveraging is just simply doing too many contracts per trade, opening yourself up to monetary risk that is exorbitant based on the equity base that you're working with. So with that out of the way, overexposing yourself. That means going in more times than you should, pursuing, chasing opportunities that you want there to be opportunities in these conditions. What conditions? Whatever that condition is that allows you for you to sit in front of the charts. If the markets are open, prices are fluctuating, you think that it's now open season, it's hunting season. Maybe. But understand this. While you may adopt that mindset that it's open season for you to go out there and start seeking opportunities to be Elmer Fudd and have your little shotgun in hand, and you want to go out there and chase Bugs Bunny, <laughs> you want to go out there and chase Daffy Duck, Okay, and if you don't know who that is, it, it's in the States, they're cartoon characters. And everybody starts off at the beginning of the week. They, they're all out there like, yeah, man, let's go. I'm going to find me an opportunity. I'm going to take me something home. And because the markets are trading, there's opportunities to trade. And everybody has this idea of what makes the markets go up and down. You overexpose yourself to what you think is a plethora of opportunities 24-7. The only opportunity that exists in that mindset or that, well, reality, is the market itself sees all of us as us being served up on a dish, like a plate for it to devour. See, the market can chew us up, ICT included, can bite me, chew me up, and, you know, take from me so i have to learn to avoid certain cir circumstances over the years i've done that i didn't do it quickly i didn't try to get through it fast because i didn't understand that it was something that i would incur or have to go through because i was too limited in my understanding as a 20 year old when i first started the books didn't talk about these things they just talked about following your setups, pushing your edge, trying to do more. Very little was ever spoken about doing the least. And if you think about it, it, it would be very hard to market that even today. You're going back to, to the 90s, 1990s for the folks that are millennial. <laughs> like my youngest son says, Dad, you're from the 1900s. <laughs> like it's, like, it's uh, like centuries ago. But in trading, you know, a lot of the industry today is young folks. And it's have it your way right now mentorships. They, they want it instant gratification. They want instant, you know, feedback where profitability is overnight and it's assured. And they don't like to be told or reminded or encouraged that it's going to take a lot more time, a lot more energy and effort to get to that point. And some of you are going to fail, not because of the things that you learn from me or anyone else. It's just simply that you're not equipped to do this. And doesn't mean that you're forever ill-equipped. It just means for that moment in time, you may be ill-equipped and you will have to accept the fact that you will fail on the temporary. Now that stays temporary if you allow it, but it becomes final when you choose it to be. So taking breaks, calling it quitting, whatever, that's normal. I did that. I did it dozens of times as a young man. But overexposing yourself is constantly seeking opportunities and insisting that they're there, forcing them, 
And because you know that there's a likelihood, there's a potential for the market to create opportunities where it might be big news this coming week. It might be big news in this coming trading session. There might be large range expansion days. If you're a commodity trader, we could see limit up or limit down days where the, the opening is the only fluctuation in price from the previous day's close, meaning that wherever the previous day's close was, when that commodity would start its trading for the day, it opens limit up. The highest it can move, the maximum amount of fluctuation in movement from the previous day's settlement price, it's not allowed to go any higher. And it doesn't trade off that. It just stays there. So when you look at a chart, it just looks like a little hyphen, a little dash. The open and the close is the same price. That's a limit up move and vice versa. You, you know, when the market's going down and it's dramatically being repriced, not buying and selling pressure, and that's how you know it's a myth. Buying and selling pressure is a myth. That's not what causes prices to go up and down. Because if that was the case, you're trying to tell me, and I make this argument all the time, a limit up day. It's lock limit up. Okay. Why can't I and why couldn't I sell out of my position? I wanted to take profit. <laughs> I couldn't. You're trying to tell me that there doesn't, when, there's not one person out there that were interested in seeing any lower tick to be able to offer one transaction outside of just the opening price being the only price of the day. It, it, it's, it's a myth, folks. It's a myth. So all of these ideas keep flooding into your mind as a trader. And you understand that we do this to make money. You might have other subordinate reasons. You want to look smart in front of your girlfriend, your boyfriend, and their family members. Carl. <laughs> um, but the number one thing should be you're trying to make money. And that's a very powerful influence. It's very powerful. It will place you in the pursuit of things that are not really there. You'll chase things that are phantoms, like trend lines. That's why I literally call them trend line phantoms in core content. Because you want this to be a diagonal support level. You need it to be because it provides you the venue on which you're going to act on and say, oh, yeah, this is the time where I want to be a buyer. Because everybody's going to see that area, too, and they're going to want to buy, too, because this imaginary two, two swing lows, if I extend a line from those two, that, that imaginary decision point in the future, everybody's going to have that same decision point and want to buy there, too. And I capitalize on that. I look for opportunities for those types of things. And when you overexpose yourself, seeking opportunities where there may, in fact, be opportunities there. But you become the liquidity. But you won't see it that way walking in. You won't see yourself laying yourself on the altar of these markets. Sacrificially just laying yourself out there. Consume me. Take me, pick me, you know, burn me up. Dismember me. Will, willingly doing it. But you walk into that condition thinking that you're going to leave in a gain. And the only thing you've gained is experience about not, hopefully, wanting to do that same thing again. And it took a lot of repetition for me to get really displeased with chasing something. Whenever I got really anxious that I was going to miss a move, or if I was really excited about uh, a particular trading week over the weekend, they were the characters that constantly came up in the play that resulted in me losing, sometimes losing an entire account. Now, I don't know why when people are new, they come here and they, they want to listen to me or whatnot. And I'm honest with you, and I tell you where I learned from and it was through pain <laughs> it was through adversity and lots of blown accounts for some reason that seems to be like 
a bad thing for, for you. Like you, I would want to learn from someone that has gone through the pain, has lost a lot of money and learned how to avoid doing that again. That, that, that's the person I want to learn from. But you know, unfortunately, that's what I'm trying to tell you many times when I, when I sat in this, this discussion this morning. You're talking about how to trade less. You know, if I wrote a book and entitled it "Trade Trade Less," nobody's wanting to buy that book. Now, there might be a little niche market in there because it's my name on it, and you know, people want to hear what they, you know, I have to say about it. But by far and large, they're not really going to be interested in it, unless you know who I am, and you're you're already interested anyway in the things I'm talking about. You probably wouldn't be a buyer of that book because what is it telling? It's saying something that is contrary to the consensus that this industry has cultivated, which is always do, do the most, never relent, maximum effort, to quote Deadpool. <laughs> and unfortunately, in you know, the three decades I've been messing around with these markets, I've learned that less is more. And I've also learned that I was prone to overexpose myself to risks that I didn't understand or could identify as risk because I was falling victim to the things that I purchased in terms of courses and books and you know people teaching this and that. And because I wanted to change my life, I didn't want it to be you know the the mundane Michael, the, the average Joe. You know, I, I was seeking and pursuing something that was bigger than just regular. I didn't want to be the regular guy. And everything that I picked up, I've always demanded it to be exceptional. And I was very disappointed that everything that I purchased and everything that I absolutely worked very hard by their rules, I followed it by their rules, and it would not work. It would not yield to me the results that they promised. It would not yield a consistency and a visibility to be able to see these things forming beforehand. And it caused me to jump into the very next thing, the shiny new object syndrome. And even in this community, because if I teach something new, I talk about something new, everyone's so quick to let go of what they're already working on that they've had progress in. And beginning to see the stages of development that hasn't happened fast enough for some of you. And because it hasn't happened fast enough for you and you haven't had a payout yet in a funded account or hasn't seen a, a, a profitable live account yield you a withdrawal yet, you haven't got to that stage yet. It's there waiting to be had, but you haven't got there yet, so you're impatient. And it's easier for you to say, well, this looks new. And everybody's going to be talking about this new thing. So I'm going to be distracted anyway. And ICT is going to be jawboning and going on and on about this new thing. So I might as well just go ahead and chase that. Because who knows? It might become easier. I might be able to get this faster. And faster is a recipe for disaster. And I was a pellet and didn't even know it. <laughs> the idea of trying to do something quicker for the sake of getting through it. I want to get profitable. I want to get to a point where I can see the setups form real quick looking at any time frame. The way you get to that level is constantly exposing yourself to back testing and watching live price action. You do not get it by overexposing yourself to risk. Because when you incur risk and you haven't learned how to do it properly yet, what is it? What is the subject matter I'm referring to when you haven't learned how to do it properly? Well, there's a number of things that in, encapsulate the it. It's number one, master of yourself. If you're never mastering the markets, I have not mastered the markets. I may look very, very versed in executions and managements and whatnot, but I still... And I can tell you that there's about eight times this week that I would have lost. Whether it would have been a demo account, whether it would have been me calling it out in, in Twitter, 
if it would have been me doing it with a, a live account, I would have taken eight losing trades this week. And it would have been no fault of my concepts. It would have been me trying to do something that I am as a human being prone to do. So when I say that, that's not a weakness. That's a strength. But because when I was a 20-year-old, I viewed it as a weakness. I viewed it as, you know, I, I would lose on a trade and I think, okay, this makes me poor as a trader in every sense of the word. I have less in the account if I had the account remaining or I'm less inclined to, to chase the next setup because now I'm scared. I don't want to I don't want to incur another loss because I didn't come from money. And when I would take a three hundred dollar, four hundred dollar, five hundred dollar loss, you know, those those hurt. Like that was a big portion of the account that I was working with. And it took a lot for me to get these couple thousand dollars scraped up to, to refund an account, paying exorbitant amounts of fees and paying for all the little bells and whistles for the data and the software programs that I was trying to constantly you know, build up and working with a, a desktop. And I see these people talking about it in their little fake documentaries. <laughs> Uh, for the record, again, uh, because you know there are people out there that try to say I have multiple laptops and they're all sitting in front of me, and I'm buying in one account, going long and going short in another. I have one laptop, folks. I have one tablet. I have eight monitors that runs on one PC, one tablet. Okay, and I facetiously mentioned like a backhanded remark in uh, the interview with Corbs. I said that uh, you know my my laptop died. Um, I had a Hewlett Packard. Okay, I had a, a, um, a desktop PC. And I had one computer with one big old monitor that literally is the size of a Yeti cooler. Okay, I'm trying to talk in terms where the younger crowd can, can kind of en envision what it is I had. But I had all these things that I thought were high technology back then. And I guess in a lot of ways they kind of were. But today, you know, you can do a lot of these things that we were trying to do and hope to do on your cell phone. And that's not the, the idea that you should be trading your cell phone, but you have more power in your cell phone to be able to pull up data, switch to one web browser tab, you know, and have a, 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 you know, a multitude of things at your fingertips. And it's like a candy land right now of just going in and gathering information, collecting data. But that same thing is also overexposing yourself, looking at too many markets, looking at too many things that's going to complicate. I can teach you intermarket relationships. I can teach you intermarket analysis. I can teach you the characteristics that one market will lean upon on another. Okay. And I can do it in a wide array of ways where I can show you every instance of how a market will influence a commodity or a commodity may influence a specific market. An interest rate will you know, affect this market. But that interest rate, that bond reaction, 30-year, 10-year, or 5-year, isn't always going to be mark-to-market, meaning that it's not going to be instantaneously the opposite or the effects of what you would expect in like SMT. There's a little bit of a delay that sometimes occurs with the interest rate markets, which makes it a little bit more complex to teach. And frankly, the way the world is right now, it's a market that I would not want to touch either. Because remember, I said I was leaving Forex years ago. I haven't been touching it. I went back to futures trading. Now, my heart is in the bond market. But I also am aware that that risk is high in the interest rate market because there could be a interest rate implosion and it could happen instantly and it could harm me. So what I'm doing is, is I'm focusing on a market that I trust, which is the index futures. I'm looking at a small universe of investment vehicles, meaning I'm only concerned about 
the S&P 500, the Dow 30, and the NASDAQ 100 composite index. That's it. I don't need the dollar index to trade any one of those. And to further simplify it, I don't trade the Dow. So what am I limiting it, limiting it to? It's, I'm looking at just the SPOOS market, which is S&P 500, and then ask that composite index. And because I want to be in the market that's going to move faster, that's going to be exaggerated in its price swings, so what have I further done? I've reduced it down to just one market, referring to S&P like I would do what? The dollar index for a Forex pair if I was trading euro or cable. So I have simplified my observations in the marketplace. I've reduced my time in analysis. I could care less with all these other markets. I only do that because I'm teaching you, and I know there's a lot of interest in you know, all the markets, and you all want me to do even more than that, and I don't have an interest or time to do it. But the things that I do in those respective markets, they're the same things I'm doing in any market I'm trading with because they're not, it's not changing. The, the method is not constantly morphing into something new because I'm following another market or, or following another asset class. So overexposing is trying to do more than it's necessary, trying to find more setups than there really are there. And let's make a distinction between what I just said and what you're probably thinking. Actually, you said you can trade every hour candle and find setups. Yeah, I can. But just like I understand that my audience that's listening to me, I have a great deal of influence. And that's very intimidating for me. Some of you think that I like this position. I can't wait. There's three weeks left and I'm done. <laughs> three more weeks and I'm not on Twitter no more. And this level of influence I have over many people who have a, a high regard of my opinion, a high regard in me as a person and the things I'm openly sharing and for free and helping other people, that influence, that power, it scares me because I know what I was like when I was younger. And if I had Larry Williams constantly at a fingertip pushing a button, let me go see what Larry Williams is saying on his Twitter right now. At the moment, whatever musing that he had in his head at the time, if he's willing to share that, that would be that would have been highly influential to me and in me taking on monetary risk. Now, would he think about that level of influence and be guarded in his opinion? I don't think so because he was making his daily I think he probably still does. I, I'm taking a great deal of liberty saying that. I, I don't actively follow what he's doing. But at the time when I was a younger guy, you know, he made his S&P calls and maybe bonds and whatever else he would talk about at the time. And, uh, but you had to pay it through a 900 number. Okay, fine, whatever. But it was behind a paywall. I'm not behind a paywall. And I don't know the level of your experience. I don't know what you know about what it is I've, I've taught. I don't know if you're a gambler. I don't know if you're reckless. I don't know if you just blindly follow anyone that says anything and you're highly influenced because you're just looking for any reason to scratch that itch. And because social media is what it is, it's an invitation for disaster because people that are not equipped to think independently for themselves it's a wonderful grocery store for you to go out and pick the right person you think you should follow blindly. And I don't want to cultivate that. I don't want to have that in my students. I want my students to be independent. I want all of you to come to the conclusion that you don't need me. And my feelings are not going to be hurt by that. That's exactly the end game. That's the, that's the result that you're looking for, not the tetheredness of me and you together. And some of you see that as that's a problem when that's just you growing accustomed to me as the man, the, the figure, the person behind the ICT, 
the inner circle trader. You've grown accustomed to that person. And while that's wonderful in a lot of ways, I'm not that person for you as a mentor. The mentor in me is saying, you have to get out of the nest. You have to do this on your own. You have to fly on your own. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. You should be looking forward to it. It's not a tragedy. It's not a, you know, it's not a drama that brings sadness. It should be like, this is graduation. And graduation may be fun for the moment, but it's scary too because you have to go out and do these things on your own and get new experiences without the hand-holding. The everyday processes of being around your teachers and your other classmates, which makes it feel more comfortable. Even though you probably hated going through school, you know, as, a, as an adult, two years out of school, you probably thought many times, I mean, I'd love to be able to go back in school. <laughs> I won't have to deal with these adult problems. Well, that's many times the same things that we experience as traders. It feels fun when you, when you start to learn something new and your, your energy level is really high. Like if I went out there and said, listen, 2024, I'm doing a mentorship. It's 100% free. We're doing it every day, Monday through Friday on YouTube. We're going to sit down. I'm going to go over my charts. I'm going to draw the charts out every single day. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to trade in front of you live every single day, the morning session, the afternoon session. Your activity level in everything else would completely stop. You would be making changes in your jobs. You'd be making changes in your curriculum at school and university. You'd be telling your spouses, listen, it's worth divorce. Everything's going to change because this is the opportunity that I knew would never likely happen. But here it is. He's doing it. And your energy level would go through the roof. Why? Because you see that opportunity to do more. And when you finally get to the point where you know how to trade, that shouldn't be like that. See, you think that it should be just like that. When I learn how to trade like ICT or ICT's best students, I'm going to outperform and I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. None of my students with this new power they have thinks of their trading like that because they know they don't need to do that. That promotes overexposure. It promotes greed. It will invite fear because what you'll end up doing is you'll fear not controlling yourself. You'll become reckless, start making mistakes. You'll disassociate yourself from the model and the approach, and you'll revert back to retail processes, which is fear and greed. Fear and greed and analysis paralysis. That's retail thinking. In, in, in encapsulated form, that's it. So preventing overexposure is paramount. I knew when I gave the analysis before we started trading this week, I said, you know, I'm going to put a limit on what I'm willing to wait for. And if I don't get this, I'm okay with not taking a trade. All week long, I'm comfortable not taking a trade. I wanted to see very specific things, and I don't want to kill the, the analysis and, and the review that I'll be doing on Sunday, which will be live streamed, by the way. So we'll be lighting the, uh, the market review at 5 p.m., and we'll see what the opening ticks are on all the markets, because I think we're going to see an extreme gap lower on equities in the next future. So, but anyway. Um, having that observation of what's going on in Israel, what's going on in, in Gaza, and how all the other Arab nations are, you know, they're getting rowdy. They're getting really jerked up and uh, animated. You know, some of the bases, the U.S. bases, have been attacked. Um, I think that's going to increase, you know, and I think we're, we're going to see a, a greater escalation in all of that stuff. And as a younger man, I looked at war, pestilence, famine, chaos, all these problematic things as cha-ching, that's an opportunity to get money. And that's how a globalist thinks. And when they see that you are 
good at that, they'll tap you on the shoulder. And then you have to make a choice. You should not have that mindset. You should have no fear of these things because ultimately, if you're wrestling with this as a as an investor, and I get this question a lot, and I promise this is not going to turn into a religious conversation, but it's appropriate for this moment for me to talk about it. I have a lot of students that are quote unquote Christian. And the number one question that comes up is should they view trading as gambling because they are told that it's gambling and God won't honor or bless this because it's gambling. Um, well, there is a way to do this that's not tr that's not gambling. Okay, um, the way I teach, number one, you're not trying to be reckless. You're looking for very specific things to qualify a setup. You're looking for things to quantify set up and also I'm teaching you to do it with very little risk not over leverage not over leveraging do the least trade with a micro lot five dollars per handle in s p two dollars per handle on the nasdaq that's that's very 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 low in terms of the multiplier for a pip fluctuation or not pip but a, a four tick or one point or handle fluctuation in the respective averages. Now, if I say trade with 15 contracts and try to go for broke every single time, that's gambling. When I talk to you in Twitter spaces, I'm talking to you like someone that has been here before, has hurt himself, has learned from it, and has also helped other people avoid these same things, and they are profitable learning to do the things I tell them to do and avoid the things I tell them to avoid. That's how they got to where they're profitable. They're not reinventing the ICT wheel. They're not revamping something. They're not improving upon it. They're just applying sound logic, mastering themselves first. But trading can be gambling in the hands of someone that's out to prove something out to prove something, vendetta trading, revenge trading. What is that? That's emotional gambling. Everybody that goes out to those casinos in Las Vegas or goes to whatever local place of gambling in your neck of the woods, wherever you're at, everybody goes there on an impulse. And anybody that says otherwise, they're liars. That impulsiveness is what? rooted in emotion. They are feeling less than they should. They feel lack. They feel depressed. They want to feel better about themselves. And what else would make you feel better than winning some money? And that's why traders start in this industry recklessly plunging into it with no model. They race in there. The only thing they really want to learn how to do is how do I open up an account how do I buy? How do I sell? How do I get out? And how can I get my money? That's what they're thinking is a mentorship. That's mentorship. That's mentorship. That's myopic mentorship. And there are dollar mentorships like that all over the Internet, all over social media, because there's a new round of suckers coming in all the time. If I was a sleeve bag, I could be making millions of dollars every month fleecing those individuals. I don't need to do that. I'm here on my weekend telling you how to better improve yourself, think correctly, how to avoid gambling, how to avoid blowing out your account, over leveraging, and today's topic is overexposing yourself. Don't open yourself up to pursue more opportunities than it's really appropriate for you. Now, trading in an environment where there's going to be a lot of knee-jerk reactions. Now, what do I mean by that? Because ICT, you always say that the markets are not you know, going up and down and fluctuating as a result of buying and selling. No, it's not. Not because of our buying and selling collectively, no. It's the delivery of price by the 
central bank. Because that's the market maker. The New York Stock Exchange, that's not the that's not the hub that starts everything. <laughs> okay. That's just the face. That's the that's the uh well, I guess I nailed it. That's the face. That's who, that's who we think it is. Okay. All the prices come from there. And it's a result of buying and selling pressure. Okay. If you want to believe that, that's fine. You're welcome to believe that. I, I, I have learned that trying to make the case that it's not that, you know, I, I'm not going to convince everyone. And frankly, I don't care. And when you learn how to do this, you don't care either. It's funny to see these people run around believing with the nonsense that they believe. But the central banks themselves, they are the masters of all this. They are the masters of money in every form of it, even your beloved cryptocurrencies. I should teach you, see what happened in Bitcoin? You said it's going to zero. It's going to zero. Okay, it's going to zero. I'm not claiming to know what every fluctuation is going to do every day. If I did, if I knew that, I'd be out here mopping the floors with all that stuff and all these crypto fanatics that follow people that I've seen no real reason to be following them, but I guess, you know, whatever. They would follow me if I called those crypto markets like I call the NASDAQ and the S&P. They'd all be here. And I'd have more headaches with more drama and personality disorders and people that just want clout. You don't want to expose yourself to that kind of environment. And I knew enough going into this week because I have journal entries. I have experiences. I have accounts where I have lost that I have beat myself up for months knowing full well that I've done it before and I should have known better and sooner. But I still went in there recklessly plunged ahead. And because I have such a, a, a large audience now. Like, I have to be careful what I say now because I know it's impactful to many of you. Like, some of you are willing to just take whatever I say because I said it, that's it. And I don't want any of you to think that. I want you to say, okay, this is what IT said. ICT said this. Let me go in here and see if what he said is valid. Is this really there? I'm taking you back. That's how I started. That's how I started as a teacher. What I'm about to show you, in 1996, when I sat down with my students then, who sat with me side by side, literally, I don't want you to take what I'm going to say today and believe what I'm saying. I want you to go in to the charts and look for these things. If you can't see them, you come back tomorrow and you tell me that you don't see them. And I'll show you how to better identify them. Because if you can't do that part first, the rest of the week, and that's all they have with me is one week. Now think about that. <laughs> you, you, I mean, look at all the content I have now. That's 30 years. And I haven't lit I've literally done a little bit less than, I oh mean, I think maybe a little bit over a quarter. Of everything that I know. That's what my compendium right now that's out there and everything that's ever been done by me is just a, a hair's breadth above one quarter. And look how much has impacted the world. But also, look how much has caused confusion, caused competition, broken hearts, sore bums. You know, people getting angry because no longer are they the, the flavor of the month. And because I'm not trying to be anybody's enemy, and I want my life back. I don't want to be a celebrity. I used last week what I learned through hardship. I know that there was going to be movement in the markets this week. Lots of fluctuations. I knew there was going to be big moves and big range expansions. I knew that was going to happen. But I also knew that there's going to be a decoupling. Now, what is decoupling? When a market moves symmetrically, these, these are the parts where you write this stuff down, folks. You not just grab another corn chip and dip it in a nacho sauce. This is where you grab a pen or a pencil and you write down things I'm saying because it's impactful to you. It, it means something. 
It's going to help. It's going to help you in the future when I'm not actively doing this with you on a week by week basis. But decoupling is when a symmetrical market no longer follows the symmetrical processes. Meaning, a perfect symmetrical market would be this risk off scenario. Right away, risk off is dollar up. Risk on, dollar down. Now, going back to risk off. Dollar index. If it's to go higher, if that higher dollar, if that is expected or we think that that's going to occur, <laughs> we have little uh, perimeter alarms in our house because I have puppies. And I want to know if they go in certain areas because I have rugs that cost more than most of people's cars a day and I don't want them to make an accident there. And I don't want no gates to block them away. So when I'm just one off, so I'll wait for my wife to turn it off. Otherwise, I would have said, hold on one second. So a, a symmetrical market, I'm not sure if you hear that, but I'm, I'm, I have to make sure if he's handling it. These are all the things that go on in a recorded video that you don't ever hear. <laughs> this is one of the things I hate doing live stuff for because I'm, I'm in my home and you're going to hear all the things that go along with it. So risk off scenario or risk off market, dollars going higher. So a symmetrical market would be, okay, equities will start to soften if they're rallying and eventually bend the knee and go lower. Currencies will all move lower as the dollar goes higher. Okay, and bond market will go opposite. So wonderful. That's a symmetrical market. However, there are times where the characteristics of a market environment, which is what we're seeing right now, there's a lot of geopolitical um, wartime upheaval. There's a lot of opportunity for the central banks to build sentiment. And also, anyone that's positioned appropriately where they can stand to be profitable they will run on those positions now they don't have a book map okay they don't have this okay here's here's huddleston's buy stops we're going to go here they don't have uh, a list of everybody by name what account number all that stuff they don't need that all they have to do is clear the board. So if I know that this environment that we're entering last week before this week started trading, okay, so in other words, I'm referring to and reflecting on the commentary that I gave last week before Sunday's opening bell, because I, I did a live stream on YouTube. You're welcome to go back and look and, and listen to it, okay? I outlined for me to be interested in trading for the entirety of the week, I wanted to see something unfold. I wanted to see the dollar index get above the upper quadrant that I outlined. And I don't want to say too much because I'm hoping if you haven't watched that video and analysis, go watch it because it's going to help you understand what I'm going to talk about tomorrow when we do our review and you know, analysis for the newbie coming. I didn't want to be so finite about this, this is exactly what's going to happen because I know that there was going to be decoupling. Meaning that the dollar index can do one thing and the other markets can do another. So if I place a limit on myself and I can only engage, if this happens, then I have a green light go. I can now start actively talking about the market. I'll start tweeting things and what I think is going to happen. And also add to it that, like I shared, in the last two weeks, we found out that my mother-in-law is now battling another round of cancer. So my wife's you know, expecting me to be at her attention when she's asking for it, and it's very distracting. So I, I can't be on point with everything that I want to be as ICT. And it's also fitting because I'm, I'm reducing my exposure to you and conditioning you to expect how it's going to be when I'm not here post November 11th. So all those things coalesced into, it would be easier for me to say, okay, if I could say what I require as a minimum for me to engage and talk about 
what I think is going to happen, then this is this is what I would look for. And I wanted to see the dollar index show me that, and by tipping its hand to me, if it went above and closed above the upper quadrant, then I wanted to then trust that the dollar index could go higher and continue going higher. Otherwise, if it doesn't do this, I'm not interested in it. And I can sit on my hands, and I'm telling you, and like I told you in that live streamed video, that I'm content with even having taken nothing for the debt or the week. Because my mind was scattered. But my impulsiveness as a human being, the man in me, that 20-year-old that wants to get out there and do silly stuff again for the sake of just doing it, overexposing myself in terms of chasing the the number of opportunities that I know that are there. And I'm going to go back to a comment I started the, the address. I didn't. I said, I know what you're thinking. And I mean, and you think that I should be able to see more setups than the average person. And I can, and I've proven that. But I also have an influence factor that is now something that's in my head. So while I'm not afraid, obviously, to tell you what I think is going to happen, when I tweet it, it never gets deleted, and it does what I expect it to do most times. Most. And I'm talking high 90%. Go back to my tweets and do the scale on it. You know, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for you to do a homework session if you want to try to say I'm a liar. But because of the number of people now listening to me, and because I'm a human being, and I'm wrestling with things with family, I'm wrestling with things with a spouse, and my attention's diverted. And on top of that, I'm literally following everything I can get my hands on in terms of what's happening in these nations that we're seeing all these things. And I'm not following the news. Like I have, I have so many students that are literally reporting to me, like, like on every 20 minutes I'm getting an update from them with real video of this is what's going on. This is what's going on in pictures and all. Like I'm, I got like – Boots on the ground there. I got intel in all these places. I don't look at the news. So when you're asking me, hey, can you tell me what news service you – I I don't do that because they're lying to you. You know, I have people that have relationships with me that are literally giving me the information firsthand right when it's happening, as it's happening. So because I have all that and I'm immersed in all of it, my attention has been on other things, and if I'm going to be distracted, and this is this is how you apply it to yourself, okay? So that way, it, it sounds self-centered, this discussion, but I'm telling you how I evolved from as a younger 20-year-old that would have all that chaos in his life, trying to pursue success, you know, trying to keep a, a too young of a marriage, you know, or not keep it, but to rekindle it because I was trying to earn my wife back. All these things that I was trying to do and also look significant in the eyes of my family and friends, all those extra things was overexposing myself. I was trying to do more than this is necessary, not understanding how to do enough and be content with it. Because if the number one reason why you're doing this is to make money, why not just simply reduce it down to what you're trying to do to make money and be comfortable doing it? While I have a lot of moving parts, I have a lot of PD arrays and things that could qualify for a setup for you, I don't use all of them unless I'm doing a trade and I'm pyramiding. And every one that exists in that fractal price action, then I will key off of it to prove that it's there. But you can use this one thing, strip it down to a specific time of day around a calendar event that is going to be higher, medium impact. And then that's it. That's all. And it's really simple. That's simple trading. But – because I have so many weapons in, in my arsenal, you all want to be a man of war like me where you want to just go out there and use all these things in your own hands. And you've not learned how to do one of them well. And that should be your pursuit. So because I had this expectation that obviously you're going into this new week, I anticipate acceleration and, and more of the things that – we're seeing over there in the Middle East in Israel. The central banks will use that 
they're going to use that sentiment that it creates and they may or may not use the underlying sentiment to benefit themselves. Meaning, okay, if all these things accelerate and intensify, my experience, my co-signing in that analysis last Sunday in a live stream review where 60,000 people were, were, were watching of it, I said, I don't think that we have topped in the dollar index. I think that we can potentially go higher. And because of all the uncertainty and the wartime things, I believe that the dollar will likely go higher. But it may need to go down into its daily fair value gap. And that's completely permissible. It's acceptable. That's reasonable. But even if it does that. I'm not saying I'm going long euro or cable because dollar index went down to its fair value gap. I'm not saying that. Now, I want you to go back and listen to what I said in that live stream. That can't be edited. It's it, People saw it. It's still there as it was said. When I said that I'm not interested and I would not be trying to go long dollar, which would be shorting euro and shorting the pound dollar, because if we're in a daily fair value gap, that would be at a discount for the dollar index. And if I'm bullish and I don't think the top has formed in the dollar index, that means what? You know, you know surface observation, just listening to that, and you've only been with it for a little while, you'll naturally assume that means I'm going to go long dollar and short euro, short pound dollar at that moment. No, go back and listen to what I said. I said, I would not be interested. I'm not saying that. Why? Because there's a decoupling I'm expecting it to not do those things. I required the dollar index to trade up to a level it never traded to at all, all week long. Well, ICT, you sound like a hypocrite because here you are. You showed you made $50,000 in a trade on NASDAQ on Friday. I had the last portion of the week. Where everything was lined up. And I'm expecting a continuation of what I wanted to participate in. And truth be told, I wanted to be in on Tuesday. Like I wanted to short on Tuesday. But I said, I can't touch it. My attention's divided. And if I don't do well, I will criticize myself more than anybody else would. So over the years of me doing this, I just simply said, okay, I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to show you. And I was willing to go all the way into Friday and have nothing. But I also know that there are people out there going to say, he's got 12 different demo accounts and 15 different laptops, and he couldn't get any of them to come out with a winning trade to go and show it to you. No. <laughs> the market maker model is what I'm going to teach as my final model on the 2023 mentorship. It will be released on October 31st. I'll release it at 9 p.m. my local time. And it'll teach, which is what I used for Friday's trade. So what I employed on Friday with the NASDAQ was all based on using a market maker sell model. It is not wiped off. I'm going to smash everybody that thinks that, that this is wiped off. It is absolutely not wiped off. This is algorithmic. It's 100% matched to the buy side, which you expect to see on the sell side. You do not see that in wiped off. Okay? It's to the pip, to the point. It's very specific. Repricing, redelivering. That's what it is. Okay? It has absolutely nothing to do with buying and selling pressure. It has nothing to do with retail logic. It has nothing to do with support and resistance. I anticipated that we would get this flash of rushing down and hit that sell side. I was When I was recording it, I wanted to see it like post 4 o'clock. I wanted to see it sprint down there and just go right down there and close below it. I made an allowance for that. But as we approached closer and closer, I was like, okay, I want to be getting out near the low. So I rolled that stop real tight and – it allowed me to get out. But it didn't go higher much beyond that. And it didn't make a lower low either. So I'm content 
with how I manage that trade. I'm completely content with it. And I don't regret anything that I should have done as the trader that was correct on the times when I was briefly looking at it through my phone. Like I wasn't peeling over the charts with my monitors in front of me. Like I'm sitting in my recliner right now in my office and I have the screens in front of me. They're off. They're, they're idle. Nothing's being on them right now. But usually when I'm talking to you, unless I tell you I'm out and about, I'm standing in front of this real estate of markets giving me a very diverse approach to seeing everything in concert, how all the markets are relating to one another, the dollar, Forex, um, oil, gold, um, everything that I would refer to as a intermarket relationship. I'm constantly getting all that feedback. Now, I also know through experience as a teacher that if I sit down with you and I show you, and some of you are asking this, and this is my response to this, okay? You want me to sit and show you and pan around and show you what's on my screens, okay? And what I'm looking at, why I'm referring to it. None of you are at that point where it's going to be helpful for you to do this because it's going to be too much information. You won't have the experience, you won't have the experience to ferret out the things that you're looking for. And quite frankly, I don't have decades to teach you the level of experience that's required to do what it is I'm doing. I, I, I mean, it sounds like a cop out, but there's, I mean, there's, at some point, there's going to be a knack that's required. And that was one of the things that was problematic for me as a teacher because I wanted to be able to teach everything. And there's certain things that I'm not allowed to teach. And there's certain things that I'm not equipped to because the factor of time, the factor of, you know, I, I, I may not be here tomorrow. I may not be here today. You know, today's not promised to me and tomorrow is certainly not promised to me. But I've done is to the best of my ability. I've been able to share in a, in a means of articulating what it is that I understand about price, it's proven to be effective because other people have taken that information and have made money with it. And they're consistently making money with it. And they're not being told what to buy and sell by me. None of my students ever get that. So when you get your results, you've done it on your own. And that's a testimony. That's, that's what you're supposed to be looking for, your own results using what it is I've taught. And you should be encouraged by the other people that have done it. But looking at all the information and being able to ferret out the, the, the right way of interpreting it, understand that I am a human being. And if I see something in price action, well, let's just make it very plain and simple. Did the dollar index give me what I wanted to see as a catalyst for me to take a trade this week? No. It didn't. So if I was being dogmatic about it, I should not have taken that trade on Friday. Did I break a rule? No. I was operating as a mentor and also limiting my exposure because I identified the fact that, number one, I'm human. Two, my attention is divide, divided and it's being diverted to other things. There's a lot of things going on and it's hot. Like all these things that are occurring over in Israel and Gaza and in the Middle East, that's a hot topic right now. I mean, good grief, I ask a Muslim a question and they want to have holy war on me in Twitter when I just simply ask the question. So while I'm not afraid of any of that stuff, it's just unfortunate that everything right now is volatile. We can't, you know, we can't even have a conversation about anything. So I know because of all these factors and what you are all incurring in your everyday to day life, things are expensive. You know, you want to be able to do this faster and you're going to blame me if you make a mistake. You're not going to own it. I place the limit on me as a mentor saying, okay, for me to talk openly about what I think is going to happen, it's going to require this. Then I'll take a trade. I'll, I'll, I'll show you something based on this information here. But as Friday came and I'm looking at price and I'm like, man, I'm teaching on the market maker models this month. It would be, it would be horrible for me to let this go by and only talk about it in a review on Sunday after the fact. 
So I wanted to have something, and I wanted to make up for not having done anything all week. So anybody out there wants to do the scaling and measuring of, you know, mine's bigger than yours type thing, you know, I did your whole month in one trade. And that, that's if, if you were doing it with real money. So that logic that I used in that trade that is incorporated in what I teach is my market maker buy and sell model. That was a sell model. Okay. So if you want to get a preview about what we're talking about, uh, I encourage you to go over to your NASDAQ chart. <coughs> Pull up your NASDAQ for December, 2023. And um, I'm doing this from my phone because I don't want to, Turn my screens on because I know if I do this with my main screens, I'm, I can turn this into a six hour session today. <laughs> do it, ICP. Do it. I'm here for it, right? <laughs> All right. So you want to go to NASDAQ, go up to a four hour chart. Some of you are like, I knew it was the four hour chart. I knew it. So if you look at your four hour chart on NASDAQ, December contract. And if you put your, give me a second here. If you put your cursor or your mouse or whatever on the low ahead of uh, October, And that would be on the 27th of September, Wednesday. Uh, that low formed at 10 a.m. on the 27th of September on your four-hour NASDAQ chart, okay? And then we had another low form. Some of you are like, I'm waiting for these guys to do it on YouTube. I'm not pulling the chart. I'll just, I'll just listen to them. Because I know these guys on YouTube, they take my Twitter spaces and they use their own charts and whatnot. So it makes it interactive, which is cool. <laughs> I ain't got anything to eat about it. Then you have October 4th at low. Okay, so you have relative equal lows there. So if you look at what price was doing between the 27th of September and October 4th on NASDAQ, that is what is referred to by me as the original consolidation of the market maker sell model. The high that was formed between those two lows on the 29th of September at 10 a.m. That's the high of the original consolidation. So that little trading range there, when I'm looking for a reason to go short, my highest probability trades, and folks, this is, this is the part of these discussions where if you don't write it down and then take what I'm about to say and go back into your old data, your old charts, your old setups where you lost money, you're going to see that it was not there. And yeah, that's the reason why you lost. That's how I discovered it. I looked at everything that I was doing with real money. And the things that constantly kept repeating. Because I wanted to know. I wasn't trying to hide myself from it. I wasn't trying to shield my eyes and say, oh, I made a mistake. Let me pretend it's not happening and find fault with everything else except for myself. Now, there was a period of time when I was like that, but when I realized that this was never going to let me go, I was infected with these things, these markets. So I have to either learn to live with them productively and profitably, or I'm going to live a miserable existence, not being able to figure out anything to do anything with it. So my observations were every time that I wanted to be a buyer or seller when I finally figured out short selling because it took me a long time to trust doing that. If I was going against what I'm about to outline here, I failed. So it goes without saying, if I can see where I was making these problematic errors that were causing me to lose my accounts, not just losing trades, blowing the accounts because I would be over leveraging placing Olympic level results and required them to be perfect. You've been there before. You're placing all the hopes and dreams on one trade execution. 
this is going to pass my funded account. I'm going to get a payout on this first trade with my first day, my first hour with my funded account, and you blow it. That's how I traded as a 20-year-old because I needed to get out of the life I was in. I hated it. I hated it. Well, in this four-hour chart, that original consolidation between the 27th of September on the four-hour and the 8th October 4th low and the high on the 29th of September, you want to draw a rectangle on that. That trading range, okay, that trading range, is something that the algorithm will reprice back below. It'll reach down below that. Not all the time. Sometimes you'll see it in the chart. Sometimes the market will just deny that. And that's why you have to use a stop loss. That's the time that you as the human will err. You'll make the mistake in believing that it will yield itself to you and it won't. You'll get real close to it and stop. Perfect example. You know what? Don't change the chart. Stay on this four-hour chart for NASDAQ. But I shared openly what I felt that the gold market might do. And I felt that it could go for those relative equal lows. It went down to a target that I mentioned, but I still co-signed. I said, me personally, it would be reasonable to see it sweep below the antique sell sign. It didn't do that. It vaulted higher. And then in the analysis I gave on the weekend, I said, you know, it would run for the buy side. And for the fellow that said, you want to make money straight ICT, go short gold. <laughs> Woo! How about that, baby? Got your ass toasted, didn't you? <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm going to miss that much. I'm going to miss that so much from Twitter. <laughs> Some of you got your earphones blown out right now. <laughs> Whatever. It's live, baby. Sometimes it's going to happen. I've been talking long enough, okay? I've been talking long enough, and it has to swing the other direction, right? But that original consolidation between the 27th of September and the October 4th low, that consolidation creates and engineers sell-side liquidity or sell stops below those relative equal lows, okay? And if we're expecting price to go up to some premium array, some reason to go up, Okay. Now I'm going to use very specific, generic retail terms so that way we can talk because I don't know what level of experience you have with me. I don't know if you're watching this on YouTube and you found somebody that's taking my Twitter spaces. I don't have a problem with them doing it. I just don't want you taking my um, analysis or teaching videos and putting them up on your YouTube channel because I will tear your whole channel down. And I've done it, and I have a, I have a few of them. It's, you're about to lose some of you. are going to lose your channel because you're monetizing my videos. I don't go for that, and I'm going to take your shit down if you do it. And no, don't email me and ask me to take away the copyright because I won't. If you think that the market's going to go up to some re, retail resistance level to offer a shorting opportunity, I don't subscribe to that. Okay, I don't view the market like that. I believe the market's going up to a premium, specific premium PD array. A imbalance or liquidity above where the original consolidation was trading. Okay, so we're expecting price to go up to go lower. Where should it go to on the basis of declining? Right below those relative equal lows at September 27th and October 4th, respective lows. That liquidity below there, they're going to want to engage that. It might not do it, but I believe we're going to gap down and open below that on Sunday. But I believe that's what we're doing. It. Or we're going to open up lower, fancy dance around the open at Sunday, and then reach quickly down below those lows. One of the two things are going to happen. I personally want to see a gap way down there and open below it. That's what I want to see. Now, what I want to see is irrelevant. What I want to see should have no relevance over your trading and your trade decisions. But my experience, what I want to see as a trader, what I want to see as an analyst, what I would expect, that something's going to happen today or has happened, and we don't know because the Internet's down in Gaza, northern Gaza. There could be all kinds of atrocities being done, some kinds of ex escalation. You know, we have Sunday still before the opening. A lot of things can happen. Shocking things can happen. We're in that climate where things like that can occur. So... 
these central banks will use that sentiment, that shift in fear, which I'm not a fear monger. I'm telling you how to master yourself in these environments. I'm not teaching you to be fearful that the boogeyman is going to get you. So I block people that do that. When they say I'm fear mongering on Twitter, you're a fucking asshole. Get the fuck out of here. I don't want to hear from you. I don't, I don't want to see your tweets. Go talk that bullshit somewhere else. I'm teaching you how not to be fearful. These things, I can't change them. You're not going to change them. You're not going to stop that war. America's not going to stop that war. Israel's not going to talk nicely and say, okay, we, we overstepped our boundaries. And you know, the Palestinians are like, okay, we forgive you. And the Palestinians are not going to accept Israel in any capacity. So there's no solution. So we all have to deal with it. Every nation's going to have to deal with it. The market's going to use it as a sentiment. But it's going to cause all kinds of you know, ramping up in volatility. So you have one of two choices. Don't trade at all or learn how to navigate it. And I'm teaching you how to navigate it. You don't have to like or even subscribe to the things I'm teaching. But don't come to my fucking shit if you're not trying to learn because you're wasting your time. As soon as I see something that's offensive that I know that you're not trying to learn, I'm going to tell you, pound sand, get the fuck out of here. So I'm not fear-mongering nothing. But I want to see it gap down below those relative equal lows on Sunday because it will be a confirmation that we're going deeper into that daily Buy sign amounts. Remember I was highlighting that a month and a half ago about that is going to be the quarterly shift target. You know, Thanksgiving. I told you, I think if I'm, if I'm correct, and I am 51 now, so <laughs> I might be having a senior moment. But don't take my word for what I'm about to say. Go back and listen to the analysis. Go back and, and, and read the tweets. I'm not getting any money for you looking at old tweets. I believe I stayed, I stated that NASDAQ, by Thanksgiving, we should be down there in that buy center balance on its daily chart. Well, we're a little bit midpoint, past midpoint of October. We have a couple weeks left. A lot of things can happen between now and Thanksgiving. And we're fastly approaching those relative equal lows on the daily chart on S&P. And NASDAQ, there's real liquidity down there. They, they, the folks that thought that that October low, that fall low is in, I told everybody, there's no reason to own equities. There's no reason to own stocks. And where's the clowns that were talking some shit? It's getting, you're getting eviscerated right now. That October low to me was suspect. It was like a fake trust it. And how do they make you trust it? Putting in fake pseudo support, double bottoms. Well, if you look inside that consolidation, go to the right of it, you're going to see that there is on your four hour chart the 10 a.m. of October 6th. It's Friday. There's a fair value gap there. In that fair value gap, Extend that over to the right. To the right of the high that forms on October 12th. All of this discussion is germane to the four hour chart of NASDAQ. Okay. And you might think, or might be thinking to yourself, man, I, I trade Euro dollar. You need to get off of this stuff. Talk about Euro. No, I don't. What I'm talking about here applies to every other asset class, it's not limited to just this. This is what price is doing. I'm trying to teach you to learn how to trust the language I'm, I've, I've been using. There's a thing that constantly re, you know, reoccurs over and over and over again, and it's the repricing to liquidity or repricing to inefficiencies. That's the market truism. That's the truth. It has absolutely nothing to do with the amount of buying and selling pressure. It doesn't lean on the logic of anything else out there. That's all the market's doing. If it's not doing that, it's consolidating. In the rare instances, and we're probably going to see more of these instances start popping up here in the coming weeks and months, you're going to see manual intervention. Where you're going to see these sudden, boom, where did that come from? Perfect example, last week, look at your Japanese yen. In seconds, it moved 100 pips, and then erased it. It looked like it was a, a, a data error. <laughs> Looks like, what is this? Then you go across all the brokers and they all have the same thing. That's why I tell you, I don't trade yen. 
I do not trade that currency because it's absolutely highly manipulated. Swiss franc is too. And gold is equivalent to that. It's, it's the event-driven market, but in wartime scenarios, you know, you can see gold moving around a lot. But that fair value gap that I just mentioned before, I'll try to extend that over to the right, it's going to behave like a point of magnetism. It's going, to, it's going to draw price into it again. It's going to act as, as a means of collecting interest, pooling interest into that range of that fair value gap on the basis of an inversion fair value gap. Now, if you have been listening to these long-winded rants and, and dry conversations, not over a chart, but in Twitter spaces, if I was a college professor and I was teaching a lecture and you paid for this course because it was part of your major and you actively wanted to learn, you would be literally writing down everything that I'd be talking about because you want to you wanna maximize the time with this professor or this teacher or the lecture. When I sit down with these Twitter spaces, I'm not here twiddling my thumbs and talking for the sake of hearing my own voice. I'm telling you the things that you should be listening for and then writing them down like I'm going to say here. If I see a PD array that my interest is in and I expect it and it's, will, it's usually willing to go back up to it if I'm bearish, if it trades up to a fair value gap, okay. Does that fair value gap create the continuation of the theory that I think that the market will go lower? Or is it performing inside that fair value gap and overshooting and then closing above it? There's a decision to be made there. But what happens and what did I say if a PD array can't be even reached? If you can't reach it, and you're bearish, and it's, it's going up, but it doesn't get there. It just falls short of it, and then all of a sudden starts showing you what? Order flow is heavy and wants to go lower. What does that mean? That means it's decidedly weak. It can't even get back to an inversion fair value gap. So if it can't accomplish that, we're really heavy. We're really heavy. And late in the afternoon yesterday, around 1.30, I was looking at rallying. I was like, okay, I know what this is. I'm shorting that. And I shorted it into a breaker. I'll show you in the review on Sunday. But I was using a breaker as, as the basis of it. And then I pyramided into it. And then it created a new uh, lower fair value gap. I traded it into the return of an impulse leg lower. I was trading that first return in, which I knew was probably going to be a fair value gap. And then I went into it again and added more. And then I didn't get that sell side delivery. I really was expecting it to do it after four o'clock, like accelerate another hundred handles, which would have been like, wow, did you see what I was waiting to see that? And everybody's tweets like, wow, where'd that come from? And then I would have been sliding in <laughs> saying, check this out, <laughs> but it didn't do it. But either way, you know, it, it was a matter of me being able to use the information I'm going to be teaching you. That is in the marketplace every single week. It's there. Every time frame, it's there. But I like a second stage redistribution on a market maker sell model. And or I like a second stage reaccumulation in a market maker buy model. Now, a market maker buy model, my, <laughs> a market maker buy model is a reverse of this. So the market would be creating consolidation, dropping down into a discount just simply to go higher, to go above the original consolidation. Here, on this four-hour chart, the structure is a four-hour market maker sell model. Now, if you look at the, the high formed on uh, October 12th, and on your four-hour chart, it should be your 10 a.m. candle, uh, that is a smart money reversal. And then you can see the low risk short forms on the October 13th, 6 a.m. candle. And it's trading right up into the fair value gap that formed 
October 12th at 10 a.m. on that candle. And then we have the first stage distribution on October 16th, which is the 2 p.m. candle. All of this is relative and germane to the four-hour chart still. And then we had a lot of consolidation in there. And then finally it dove down. And then we have the second stage redistribution at 10 a.m., uh, Thursday, October 19th, and that leg lower did not trade. It did not trade below the original consolidation of the October 27th. I'm sorry, the September 27th low and October 4th low. So there's still room and opportunity to see that expansion lower. And I saw the afternoon rally going in at 130. What's at 130? What did I teach you about 130? I'll give you a minute to think about it while I get a drink. 130 ends the lunch hour macro. It's, it's like whatever's going to happen in lunch, it ends at 130. So I can take a trade and I start observing. What time did I start telling you that I observe the PM session? 130. Why? Because it ends at 130. But there's no lunch. Nobody takes a lunch ICT. <laughs> the markets are run on this idea. It's all controlled. There's a time and schedule for all these things to occur. And when that market was rallying in the afternoon after lunch yesterday, it trades up into a breaker. That was the draw for it. And then it rotates lower. And it gives you everything you would expect to see form. If it's going to drop, there's acceleration down, creates a fair value gap in the form of a city, sell side imbalance, buy side efficiency. Then it trades up into that, offering what? An opportunity to get short again if you missed it. And then ride it going into the last hour of trading. And just hold for these lows here on the September 27th and October 4th respective four-hour lows. I don't think it's going to just go there and stop. I think it's going to dig next week deeper into that daily buy side imbalance, sell side efficiency. That quarterly shift target I gave you a month and a half ago, when we were trading up, everybody else is seeing it's going to keep going higher. It's going to keep going higher. I see, I'm going to bet you that it's going to be higher. Where are you at now? You blocked me. That's where you're at. <laughs> All these things is a tapestry that requires you to spend time learning this language, sitting with me, observing it, and not trying to rush out there to get money. And because things are expensive and they're getting more expensive, you're all going to hang on the words that I tell you, and you're going to use that as a catalyst to get into a trade that I did not tell you to take. And that's what I think about more than anything anymore now, because there's so many of you. It's very intimidating for me because I don't sound like an introvert when I'm talking to you like this because I'm shielded. I'm in my little bubble here. I'm comfortable. I'm in my own space. But I would not talk to you this way if we were in a group setting. Now, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be a name dropper here because I don't think it's disrespectful. Uh, Tom Hugard has been trying very hard to get me to go over and be a part of his uh, his venues. And number one, I don't fly. Two, um, I, I just, I don't feel that travel's a good thing for right now. And my wife simply wasn't going for it. So not because she doesn't trust me, but she's like, no, nah, let's just, you know, just not do that. But the predominant thing was I would not feel comfortable. And I told this to the time I said, I, I'm just not comfortable in that setting. Like I'm not comfortable. And I have lots of people asking me for interviews, sit down in front of, you know, yeah, a nice uh, studio setting and, and have a, you know, real good discussion about what I, I'm teaching, what, what I've done, what my vision of the future is for, you know, what is I've shared and, or just to have that first in-depth face-to-face, you know, and probably ask all the questions that you want to ask me. I'm just not comfortable with that. And it took a lot of confidence that Corbs would be respectful 
and he had the dis- disposition and demeanor that I felt was appropriate. And I gave him, the least of everyone on the YouTube community, the person I would sit down and just talk openly with. And I was very uncomfortable in that conversation still, too. And there was things that we talked about that I asked him to admit. I asked him to take those things out. But I was being considerate to him, and then the questions he asked, I answered. But those questions I've already answered publicly anyway. I've already stated all these things before. But I am absolutely introverted, and I feel empowered, I guess, in a way, in the solitude in this medium like this. It allows me to be something I wouldn't otherwise be able to do in front of a large group of people because it's intimidating to be in front of other people. Not because this stuff doesn't work, not because I don't think that you know I could do it. I just don't feel comfortable doing it. I'm real wordy you know, and long-winded like this because I'm trying very hard to articulate something I want you to understand. I'm, I'm ob- observant that some of you want it done quicker and shorter, but I'm also a realist and I'm also aware that what you're asking can't be delivered. You can't learn this stuff in five minutes, short little trainers. It would take millions of them, and you still would be doing what I'm trying to do anyway, which is cultivate the idea that you have to be patient, and you're going to learn in your own pace. You're going to learn in your own comfort. You're going to discover what makes you uncomfortable and what makes you comfortable, and you want your learning to be very comfortable. And as an educator, I have to be comfortable. Otherwise, I'm not going to give you my best. If I'm like I discovered when I did my first year mentorship and I had 865 people, that was the first round entry of what came in. And I had go to webinar. And all 865 of those individuals was asking me something right then and there. And the weight of me not being able to answer every single person hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, Wow. Like, how am I going to answer all of this? And how can I manage their expectations when they all feel like they deserve and they did, they do deserve to have their question fielded by me? But you'd also be surprised to see how many of them were just the rewording of the same questions. And that's why I tell all of you, I promise you, because I've been doing this enough time now, even before 2016, I already know what questions you're going to ask. I already know what you're wanting to know. I already know what you feel like is a problem for you right now, but it really isn't a problem. But you're not willing to listen to these discussions where I'm willing to sit down with you, spend my personal time. This is, this is expensive for me. I could be doing lots of other things right now. I don't have to be doing this on my weekend. I'm choosing to do this because I care. I want to see you succeed. I want to see you do well. But I also want to do the best as an educator, and I don't want to half-ass anything. So when I try to teach something, I go into all the little subtle nuances that are going to be impactful, even though you may not appreciate it at the time because you think it's extra, it's fluff. It's not fluff. It's something that's going to be paramount to you because at some point you're going to try to implement this information. You're going to either do it with a live account, a funded account, combine, or a funded account, or a demo that you have a whole lot of hopes and you know, set Goals, if it does this, then I'm going to move to a funded account or I'm going to go to a live account if it performs well in this demo account. But you're not going to have all the information because you want to just pick and choose and have selective understanding. You want to go to somebody else that's trying to teach my su- my subject matter. I, I don't know how else to say it than it's going to take you longer. And I've done everything I could over the years to try to simplify something that's very, very complex. If these markets are in fact ran by an algorithm, and I'm framing that in the argument for the people that don't want to believe it. If they are, wouldn't it require a great deal of theory to be understood on, on, on what basis do they implement 
the price runs higher and lower. And when would they consolidate and frustrate you and not present opportunities when other people might see something in the chart and say, oh, there's something there, and they get whipped, sawed, and chopped up? I'm sharing that with you. I'm telling you when to see the markets in it. It's going to be problematic. There might be opportunities there, but it won't be easy because it's going to be high resistance. And it still might go to where you think it's going to go, but it won't be a clean one single run to it. And I'm teaching you how to identify that. That's what you want to be pursuing. But those runs don't happen every single day. Those low resistance liquidity runs do not happen every day. Price fluctuates, yes. Price runs for liquidity each day. It runs for inefficiencies each day. But on the basis of how they do that, there's a differentiation between a high resistance run where it will run a little bit, pull back, consolidate, run a little bit, pull back, consolidate, deep retracement, go up a little bit more, not go to where you think it's going to go, and then retrace even further, run where your stop loss is going to be, and then run there. That's high resistance. If you're just now learning how to trade using what I'm teaching, you'll fall victim to that and think that none of this works and you'll quit because you don't have the experience or the, the backdrop of having back tested and seeing this happen sometimes. And that's why I teach the way I do, because I want you to identify the characteristics that create those environments that's going to be high resistance, not for the sake of, you know, telling you not to trade when there's Joe Blow down the street that's telling you, you know, here's what I can do and this is what I've done. And this is what my students did. OK, I get students that get lucky doing something that I would have never told them to engage in. And they think that that was experience using something. But I'm not going to shoot down their inspiration. If they're motivated by that, I'm not going to talk that down. But I've seen many of my students come forward and say, look at this. I did this and did this. I'm like, OK, I know enough to know what you're thinking you saw there was the, the, the valid pursuit of that move. But for me to say that would deflate them. So I don't do that. And some of you might think, well, that, you're a terrible mentor because you should be correcting them. No, because in the beginning, you need every bit of cheerleading. And some of these people are very, very new. And if it keeps them inspired to keep doing it, by experience and by default, they'll learn what it is they should see in it. Like anything else, any trader that's been doing this for a long period of time, you know where your growth and growing pains were. And as much as you hated going through it at the time, as a mature, consistently profitable trader, you can look back and say, I'm thankful that I went through that because it makes me stronger as an analyst. It makes me stronger as a trader. It gives me the freedom to not pursue something that's probably going to hurt me. So knowing all those things, don't worry, I'm not going to leave out all the things on Sunday. I'll, I'll actually give you all the details here with this, what I use and get into it and, and all that business. But uh, for the sake of discussion and moving on, um, there are times where with my experience, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to bridge over 30 years of experience now doing this, I can't in any way, shape, or form reduce it, condense it, um, make it uh, quicker for you to digest and learn properly and know exactly what to do, when not to do in any shorter fashion. And it's not for a lack of trying because I've tried. For decades, I've tried to make this shorter and sweeter, and I just don't know how to do it. And it might be a limitation on me as a teacher. I'd like to subscribe to that view, and I think that's what it is. But what if it's not? Can you fault me? Because I'm, I, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. And I, I, you know, for some of you, my best isn't going to be good enough, and that's okay. It used to hurt my feelings because I, I wore my heart on my sleeve, and I wanted everybody – to, to warm up to the things I was teaching and find easy success with it. And when I had people in my mentorship leave, 
they took it. I mean, I took it to heart. Like, I mean, it's like, no, why would they want to leave? Like, I'm literally calling the market beforehand every single day, and it's unfolding like this. And I discovered over time, listening to people explain their hardships and what they wrestled with, they wanted to trade with it. Not just, okay, yeah, you said it was going to happen, but I want you to put me in the trade. I want you to carry me through the trade, thinking that that's going to somehow make it easier for them. When the only thing that would have done was create a codependence. And some of you now have codependence because you're upset about me saying that I'm leaving social media in three weeks. Like the end of the world's coming because I'm leaving that. When you have the greatest learning opportunity ahead of you, you shouldn't be afraid of that. It's exciting. But I know what it was like feeling like, you know, I, I, I reached the end. There's nobody else that's going to help me. What happens if I never get it? What happens if I never get it? If I never get past where I'm at right now, when I finally threw in the towel and said, I'm not buying nobody else's books. I'm not buying anybody else's courses for the sake of learning. I, I still bought things because I wanted to see the things that I was teaching people one-on-one. -on -one, I wanted to see those, those things start coming into the industry. Things that I talked about on Baby Tips found their way on ForexMentor.com. <laughs> and I had a heated exchange with uh, Vince Noble in an email. And I talked about it with Chris Laurie, and I told him, I said, you know, you're the only person that had any value over there on that website. But, you know, for a number of years, I bought everything over there. And honestly, and I'm sure they're going to come and create side puppet accounts and come and troll me and whatnot, but Everything on that fucking website, ForexMentor.com, it's a bunch of bullshit. Bullshit. It's all bullshit. The only thing that was redeeming with what Chris Lurie was talking about was he mentioned price action without indicators. But I don't trade with Chris Lurie's shit. And his own students that came to me and are still with him, they co-sign on that. I still think that if you don't like what I'm teaching and you want to have something that I believe is away from indicators, and I don't know if he's still doing what he did before, but I did watch him change. I did watch him delete years of content and focused on what his new um, website and mentorship stuff was, or what he calls it, permit, uh, pro. Uh, what is it, pro something, I don't know, it's case, you know, uh, pro charity club. He, he, he wiped away years of what he used to teach and how he used to teach it and only has, you know, the last few years gone back, which, you know, it's his stuff. He can, he can run his house the way he wants to run it, but the way he used to teach was support resistance. And I just, you know, it, you know how I feel about that. <laughs> it's, it's bullshit. It's what it is. But as a foundation, if you've never learned how to trade and you want to learn how to just start looking at price, that's a really good starting point. The idea of supply and demand, which is not what I teach, and I think it's ultimately bullshit, that's a good beginning point because I think the best students that I have and I've gone back and forth with this throughout the years, but I can tell you now. I'm convinced that my better students are the ones that try everything outside of me first. See that it's all bullshit. And then when you come and you sit with me and I talk about what the market's going to do in advance, and then you watch me call it, trade it, use real fucking money, make more money than these people make in a year. Everything else is absurdly stupid and nonsensical. It's dumb to subscribe to anything else. And that's what makes me polarizing. That's what makes people hate me. That's what pe makes people that sell courses and other shit that might follow me, might like me because I'm sharing with the community, but they don't like this part about me. And I get it. But wouldn't you want to know my opinion? Like if you asked me, if I was on these interviews everybody wants me to be on, and they asked me what my opinion, I'm not going to bite my tongue. I'm going to say what I've always said. It's all bullshit. <laughs> it's all bullshit. 
you believe in something that is not having any basis for what causes these markets go up and down. But for someone that's brand new, brand new in trading, they don't know how to read price. They don't know. They're intimidated. I saw enough from Chris's work that I had told many times, listen, go check his stuff out. He never gave me kickbacks for that. I didn't ask for that. I was giving you a personal opinion. But I also was inviting people to go really look at that stuff. And you tell me if that's what I'm teaching you because it's not. But as a beginning basis, foundation, sure. I think it would help you. Is it the be-all, end-all? Absolutely not. Is it the pinnacle of understanding what price action? Nope. Is he going to teach you what the algorithm is going to do when he's going to do it? Nope. Is he going to teach you patterns that you can study and build a model on? Sure, I think he can. Supply and demand gives you a conceptual idea of the premise of support and resistance without <laughs> there, with support and resistance, it's a vague theory that is going to be if we have 100 people in a room, okay? That's okay. Here's a chart of corn. I'm not going to tell you the time frame. It's irrelevant. And you're, you're thinking, well, I wouldn't even trade corn. Okay, well, it's not the discussion. If I show you price fluctuations in the corn market, and I don't tell you what the time frame is, and I say, okay, show me right now where the trend line support resistance is, diagonal and horizontal. And then we collectively took all of the feedback that everybody that would be willing to sit down and do that, all 100 people, you're not going to see everybody agree with the same levels. You might see a, a, a collection of certain levels being highlighted. But just because of that makes it of no value, it doesn't mean that the market's going to do that. It just means that this is what these people have been conditioned. They've been taught. They've been trained. They've been primed because that's exactly what this is. It's priming. If we were in, uh, 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 I've been so tempted to do this, but I, I just felt that it would feel kind of weird. <laughs> but yeah, I am a man that, as a younger man, as a child, actually, um, I was always fascinated with magic. Sleight of hand, um, prestidigitation, they call it, okay, where you, you can hold something in your hand, move a little bit and it looks as if it's vanished and make it appear somewhere else. Okay. And I could literally do that right in front of you, sitting right in front of you, and you won't know you won't know what I'm doing. Okay. You won't know it. I could do it with cards, I could do it with coins, I could do it with small objects. And you'll be entertained by it. And you'll want to know how I did it. Okay. That pursuit of wanting to know how to do it doesn't mean you want to learn how to be a magician. You're just met with, I feel inadequate, I need to know. When I looked at support resistance, I didn't want to learn how to use it right. I wanted to know how I'm going to fail using it. Because if there's that many opportunities to pick that many lines, which ones are going to fail? Because if I can figure out that, then what by default, what am I doing? I know which ones are going to work, right? So I, when I look at things, I look at, okay, how is it going to harm me? What am I going to do wrong? With that in my hands, what am I going to do wrong? I'm not enamored by something new that comes out. Somebody else may come out in the next year or two, five years, whatever, you know, if I live long enough. Some new thing might come out in trading, some new indicator, some new something or other, okay? And... I'm not going to abandon this, what I have, okay? Because there's nothing going to improve upon perfection. Like, I'm literally able to tell you beforehand, you're seeing it in your own charts, where the market will respect these inefficiencies, the highs and the lows, and then they'll refer to them one more time in the future. And then they'll act as what you would expect a support resistance theory to do. But guess what? They don't teach inefficiencies like that. Chris Lloyd doesn't use an old imbalance as support resistance. It's one and done. This one's done. That's his words. It's verbatim. He's done with it. The guy he learned from, that's the logic that he had. 
That's the differentiation between me and him and everyone else. These very specific PD arrays, they're not rooted in retail. They're algorithmic. These are things that are going to repeat. But if they don't even get traded to, that tells you something. It's, well, in this case, for the S&P, I'm mean, not the S&P, the NASDAQ, it's decidedly weak. And it's going to start going lower and start looking at every premium array, every up close candle as a bearish order block, and aim for the liquidity. Because there's no inefficiencies to the left once that afternoon 130 rally happened. Everything was liquidity, sell side. It just so happens that it ran out of time before it got there. So that's why I'm saying that I expect it to gap down there on Sunday's opening or gap opening lower and then trade down there on Sunday going into Monday's London session. That's what I anticipate. I feel confident in saying that because we didn't do it on Friday and there's nothing else for it to be reaching down there for. And it would make perfect sense to wipe the board for everybody that tried to pick the bottom in fall, September, and October low. I'm listening to people on CNBC say, oh, the low's in. People are going to be really caught off guard because they want to see this. The stocks are going to go higher. Where are they at right now? They overexposed themselves. They married the vein. They went out there and they went all in. You ever seen that movie Rounders? It's one of my favorite movies. The Russian KGB. <laughs> he's playing poker with uh, Matt Damon. He's taking his, his chips saying, I'm all in. He's splattering all the chips and stuff. Real cocky, real arrogant. He knows everything. He thinks he's got Matt Damon over the barrel. Overconfidence. Overexposure. And Matt Damon kills him right then and there. And he zaps out. That's how you react when you think everything for that one trade you're in. Because look at the climate. All this stuff's going on. This guy was talking to me last week you know, on Twitter. Thought he knew everything. You know, oh, yeah, you want to be trading. Well, I, think, I don't think it was last week. It was the week before. These are the best times to trade. But he just announced publicly that he just found profitability. So if he just found profitability, he doesn't have track record. He doesn't have the ability to stay profitable. He's just now tasted it one time. So now that's who becomes the mentors. That's who becomes influencers, which is one of the things I hate about social media. You have to be with someone. Spend time with them. Because if they know what they're doing, you're going to see it. There's no doubt about it. You will know absolutely that there's valid theory being implemented. It's not contrived. It's not being pulled out of your ass on you know, any given moment. Oh, this is pulled out of thin air and here it is. And just you know, dazzle them with bullshit. That's not what this is. This is logic that keeps repeating. I'm teaching you how to protect yourself, which is first and foremost, capital preservation is the first thing that you have to have in your head that, okay, there might be an opportunity there, but in the event that it isn't, I'm not going to over leverage and I'm not going to push too hard. I'm not going to do five trades today just because there's something going on around the world that's causing the market to move all around. So therefore, I see that as opportunity and I might catch a big run. Might needs to be underlined, highlighted. Might is not a absolute. Might is not a definitive absolute. You're going to have that happen. It might. And what I've learned in 30 years is those invitations where things might happen in your favor are more apt to be against you. But you went into this with the only wearing rose-colored glasses, and it's only going to be your outcome that's going to come that way. And you wrestle with it, and you arm wrestle because you have spent the whole weekend – it's going to be a big mover. There's going to be a lot of speakers. There's going to be red and medium impact folder events around the economic calendar. That means there's going to be a lot of movement. And I'm a trader, damn it. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to trade. 
into drawdown, into losing your account, into failing your combine, into needing a new reset. I'm trying to spare you that because even though they may be limited in scope in terms of, okay, say you lost your funded account, big deal. What did you really lose? You just got to pay the fees to get back into it again and put the time into get it back. Okay, it's an aggravation. Is it the end of the world? No. If you lose your account with your own money and you had, I don't know, 100,000, 50,000, 75,000, whatever it is that you would have in 10,000, 5,000, whatever it is, if it's real money that you put in there and you lose it, that hurts. That hurts. That's like a kick in the stomach. It didn't just, ow, that hurt, and it goes away real quick. It, 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 it hangs around for a little, it's like a liver shot. It just takes everything out of you and you're hitting the floor. Because that was your money that you worked very hard saving up and you invested it with intentions of growing it. But then you didn't execute with a model. You didn't think about the things I'm talking about in this discussion today, which is identifying invitations to overexpose yourself. Just because there's going to be a potential for high volatility doesn't mean that you should be in, this, in those waters swimming around. I, in other words, I, I looked at this week that we just closed much like I view non-farm payroll. Where, yes, everybody expects some measure of volatility. Absolutely. It, it, it goes without saying. There should be, and it's reasonable to assume that there's going to be volatility when 8.30 comes on non-farm payroll Friday. The reaction to those employment number data is going to create this excitement to be a participant in the marketplace. And the market participants are being led astray by the algorithm and or manual intervention that creates these price runs higher or lower. And they want you to chase it. That's not buying and selling pressure that's causing these extrapolations higher and lower. That's not what's happening there. And because it's moved around, You've seen it happen before. You think that you're going to be able to navigate that and get in there and take a trade. And now the same mindset that causes people to trade that non-farm payroll, when they see geopolitical things heating up, market getting volatile, well, guess what? It's casino time. It's time to get out there and press our luck. Well, that's not what I do. I've learned that these are the very – Economic climates that I have unraveled myself. I've done it in stunning fashion. I've done it faster than I ever thought I could. <laughs> okay? And believe me, it's demoralizing. Okay, it sucks. So because I am in a role of a mentor and because I have real things going on in my personal life with my wife's mother and a niece that you know we may have to adopt and we don't know what what the outcome and what would be required of that. Like there's, there's a whole, like my kids are almost completely done. I have one child left homeschooling. He's got two years of schooling left and then we're done. You know, it, it's, it's a lot of things being weighed on us as an uncle and aunt to a child that's troubled. And all these things are tugging at me. And now there's another potential terminal outcome to her mother-in-law, uh, to my mother-in-law, her mother. And because of all that and the economic climate, I know that if I say something, just go back and look at any tweet, any video. I mean, there's a joker on Twitter that was talking about how you know, to make money, say everything I say about IC, you know, what ICT says and short gold. And it ramrodded it, went higher. Taking things out of context, or taking something that I say and sugarcoating it to make it fit what you want to see happen in your own trading, I don't want to open myself up to that level of false criticism. It, 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 that's not even the right word I'm saying. I don't want anybody to be able to say, you inspired me to do something when you said that. So if I say nothing and I place a limit on me, if the dollar does this, then I will be willing to engage and talk about what I think is going to happen. But unless it does that, I'm not going to do it. And it didn't deliver that. But yet will happen. I said, if the dollar goes to that point, 
then I'd be willing to take fair value gaps to sell short on NASDAQ because that's the market I would be interested in trading only. I'm not interested in S&P, but they should still go lower. And gold, you know, it should run that buy side. It, it did that. Euro and cable should move lower if the dollar goes up there. So now, with that idea in mind, dollar went down to its daily fair value gap and then stagnated in the fair value gap. But yet, wait a minute. Cable was doing almost similar price action on its daily chart. That doesn't make any sense. Wait a minute. The NASDAQ and the S&P dropped all week long after Tuesday's high. But the dollar is in its fair value gap being held. What is that? That's decoupling. If you're new and you're trying to implement the things you see in my core content lessons or the things that you see me teaching in an individual, like, like a TGIF setup, okay? Because I taught that setup in that context to, to, to interpret price action, go back and listen to it again. And you're going to find that I had said this and it's not hidden from you, but because you went into it with selective hearing, you want to go in there and take something, to use the metaphor that I used you know, earlier here and many times, it's, if I show you a magic trick with cards, okay, immediately you want to grab the cards from me and see if they're a real deck of cards, and they would be real. It, you could bring your own deck of cards, and I would be able to do everything in those cards that I could do with a card deck I had in my hands before we met. Because I understand how to manipulate them. I know how to do all the sleight of hand. I do all that stuff. Okay. Well, when you listen to my lectures about trading and you're brand new, it's it, predominantly it's the men. It's always the men. I've never done a magic trick for a woman where she's like, oh, let me see. I, I can do that too. They, they, they never do it. They don't, they don't have to prove they have a bigger dick. Okay. They, 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 just, they don't think that way. But a guy, one, right away, okay, give me, a, I, I know how to do it. I know how he did that. And they fall on their face. And then they're mad at me because they think I tried to make them look stupid. When I didn't invite them to pretend they understand how I did it. But most of you that come as a young man and you watch me teach you how to do these things, you'll sit down, you'll watch the video, you'll probably scribble a couple things down. Because otherwise, you know, you want to be able to say, if I say you need to take notes, you can say, oh, I did that. But you're not really listening because you'll go back and listen to the same videos and say, oh, shit, I didn't hear that the first time. Why? Because you went in there looking for just enough to go out to a chart and try something. And then you what? F-A-F-O. Fuck around and find out. And so many of you want to go out there and try to do that with your accounts that have real risk. You, you invest the money into a funded account challenge and you fail it because you tried to do something prematurely. You don't know what you're doing. You just went out there to try to figure it out. Okay, he said this. If it looks like that on the chart, it's probably going to do that. Okay, but what else can I say about that? Just because there's a fair value gap doesn't mean it's going up there to go down. If the idea is that it's ultimately going to go higher, we want to see it trade through the fair value gap and then come back and treat it as what? A discount array to accumulate new longs. But see, you're not willing to listen to that because you want to see something that will be a catalyst, something that gives you the inspiration and the excuse why you couldn't control yourself and you had to press the button because you heard ICC say on a video, this is what it does. So therefore, every down close candle is a bullish order block. And that's not true either. And that's why it's important that you are properly mentored. You have all these long winded, dry, boring discussions which is required. You can't teach this stuff without it. And nobody else knows it. So you can't go to somebody else, even as much as they may have my logo and they may talk about me and, and have respect openly and publicly, but they're just still trying to milk my whole brand so they can make money teaching something they don't fully understand. And then you wonder why people are confused. It's not because they're getting confused from what I'm teaching. I'm laying it all out here for you. I'm giving it to you for free. I'm explaining in advance why it should do this and why it shouldn't do that. 
how to avoid markets that are going to be problematic. The fact that the dollar index went down into its fair value gap on the daily chart and didn't rally supports the idea why I said in the live stream analysis last Sunday. I said, even if it does drop down there, I'm not saying that I would be going long dollar there and short euro and or cable. Because of the decoupling characteristics that this environment is creating. You have to be highly selective. You're not going to have that skill set if you're brand new. If you're, if, even if you were in my 2016 first mentorship group, they are not going to know what I was utilizing going into this week. They're not going to have the experience doing it. They don't know it. It takes time to do these things over and over and over again. It's seeing, okay, this is what it should do, but I'm being cautious because it's probably not going to be conducive for a continuation in a higher dollar rally. I'd like to see it go higher, and I told you what I'd like to see. If it does that, then I'll commit publicly and start talking about what I want to see too. But it, until it does that, I, I'm just sitting on my hands, and, and I'm comfortable with it. If I've got nothing to share in advance, that's fine. But what did I tell you about the dollar index? I said 106.55 is too clean. How much more did it go above that? Not much. And then went back down into its daily fair value gap. Was I right or wrong? It depends on who, who's answering. If you want to make me look like I don't know what I'm doing and I'm a fraud or a con artist and I can't call things in advance, I won't trade live in front of you, you'll say, well, you got lucky there or it's up for debate what you were really meaning by that. And other students who have been with me for a long time know that there's value in that because that was the draw on liquidity. Nothing higher was suggested because what did I say? That level's too clean. Meaning what? It's ripe. It's perfect for a sweep. Do sweeps continue? No. They go above it, they retrace lower. You won't know that when you first warm up to this content and find me. You won't know that. I'll be cryptic to you, which is frustrating. But it's not, it's not hidden from you. It's in all those videos. Seeing me do it over and over, explaining it beforehand, over and over and over again. It's conditioning you to trust the theory because if it doesn't work, I won't be able to use it beforehand and show you what it's going to do. If I don't know when the market's going to be problematic, I wouldn't be able to tell you in advance this is what's likely to occur, and therefore I'm sitting on my hands. And, they, and there, there are weeks that are – look at how it was in the first part of the week. It was weird, right? It was running up, down, up, down. Like what the hell is this thing trying to do? Right. I'm not worrying about it. I have other things to deal with. But where I felt comfortable, I'll point to it. And the only thing I felt comfortable sharing was that 106.55 level on the dollar index was too clean. And then right after I said that, it ran up there, and that was the high. And then pfft, right down into the daily fair value gap and stayed there. For some of you, you're thinking, well, what's the big deal about that? Who cares, dude? You know, it's the dollar. It didn't move that much. It's the context around what it was not willing to do, which was to go higher, and the fair value gap didn't fail either. Oh, but it did. It went outside the fair value gap on the lower end. It did a little tiny little mohawk. Did it close below it? No. Look at the next candle. It's inside the fair value gap. That's what I teach. That's order flow. All those things are supporting the idea that, guess what? Gold's rallying while dollars sitting still. Is that symmetrical or is that decoupling? It's decoupling. They should be moving in opposite directions. If they're never agreeing, one going one direction and the other going the other, they should be diametrically opposed in, in a symmetrical market. Gold's in a fast-paced run for that buy side. And it went there, didn't it? And it made sure it ran through it. So anybody that was short riding gold lower that has a trailed stop loss, they're really reaching up in there while the dollar index is in its daily fair value gap, which we identified on Sunday. So it's confirmed my suspicions about how we might be problematic going into this week. And what the market I wanted to see, which is NASDAQ, it did go lower. But I had to wait until Friday where I had very little left in terms of time 
and I felt confident that, okay, this is so heavy handed. At, at this point, I don't need the dollar index to do anything. The weekly range is going to be what it is and go back to the TGIF. You think that every single weekly range, because I talked about the likelihood of a retracement, if we have a, a large range expansion on a weekly candle, those are the conditions where you can see a retracement back to 20 to 30%, sometimes as much as 40%. But it's a general rule of thumb between 20 and 30%. And you can be a counter trend trader, if you want to call it that, or market reversal trader on a Thursday going into Friday. And use setups that it would capitalize on that type of framework. I am not saying, and go back and listen to that lecture again, because it's only one video. I don't sell the idea that every weekly candle should be treated that way. There are instances where if we are bearish, okay, if we're really bearish on a market, and it's not yet reached an objective that we're aiming for, but we're real close to it. Perfect example, look at the daily chart on S&P and NASDAQ. They're real close to their old lows in September, October, right? They're real close to it. So why would you expect a 20 to 30% retracement when we're reaching for those levels? I'm teaching you shouldn't have that mindset. And because we closed on the low, that's why I'm saying they're going to puke up their guts on Sunday's opening. I think that they're going to gap this thing lower where the people that would have otherwise been short, but too afraid to hold over the weekend. And I'm, the, I'm in that crowd. I don't want to hold anything over the weekend because that gap risk, you know, I could be wrong. You know, something might happen where, you know, Israel says we're wrong. We're pulling out and we're not doing anything else to the Palestinians. And it's a wrap. And all of a sudden the market gaps up 200 points. Oh, well, then there you go. <laughs> can, can I predict that? No. Would the market participants believe that and still buy it after that opening gap up? I don't know. I don't care about that. I'm not trying to predict what the central banks are going to do where they create that opening price. Because that's where it's at. That's what's happening. That's something that I can't teach you because I can't adequately and consistently predict what the method or methodology they employ, how they start a new week. Now, I could have a, a conjecture, something that I think might be a scenario that unfolds, and if it does this, then I'll do that. There are scenarios in which I would be willing to engage price action if it meets that criteria. But in the sense of doing that, uh, there's also scenarios where it – if it does these other things, then I'm not touching it. And you need to do those types of things in your trading. You need to highlight in the beginning part of your development what makes you comfortable not doing anything. You have to have processes. You have to have routines, protocols that you have written out, not just, well, you know, I'll, it's something I thought of once in a while. No, it's just something you absolutely codified it. It's part of your repertoire. If the market does these types of things, I will not engage, and they need to be cast in stone. It's beneficial for you to have that in the beginning. It's like bowling with those little guardrails. You know, when you, watch, you ever take your kids to the bowling alley, and they have those little rails that you can pull up so that way nobody ever gets a gutter ball. It, 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 given enough momentum forward, the, the ball will hit a pin or more, and you'll have some kind of response for the children to feel like, oh, yeah, I did something. You need every bit of training wheels and those guardrails in the beginning because you need to see pins drop. You need to see distance in that bike being pedaled by you. Oh, this is what it feels like to be riding a bike. But you know enough to know that even if you lean too far to the left on those training wheels, you're not holding yourself up. Those little training wheels are. And it's a matter of learning how to trade the balancing act of moving left and right and not feeling the effects of the training wheel. And if you can do that, then you can take one training wheel off. And you learn to trade 
only moving this way to the right, but knowing that this weakness creates a necessity for me to have a training wheel. What do I mean by that? For me, it was shorting. I, I needed to keep the training wheel on me as a bear when I first started training as a trader. I, I was afraid of shorting. I didn't understand the concept. How can you sell something you don't have? And over time, years, I became more comfortable trying it. And it took a lot for me to work through losing going short. Because I was wrestling with these preconceived notions that the market action I've had up until that time was only being long. I wanted to be a bull. It made sense for me. because. And why did I think that? I heard one statement. And this is why I want you to understand. This is why it weighs heavily on me as a mentor with having this many people following me now. Larry Williams said in his four VHS take course, the Confidential Futures Trading Millionaire course, whatever it is. <laughs> I always switch the title. The, uh, the statement he made was, the stock market is predisposed to go up. So therefore, if my hero, the first real mentor that I had that I subscribed to, everything he said, I hung on every word he said. I trusted everything that man said in print or spoke. And I hung on every word. And because he said that, that was enough for me to never want to go short. Now, I am aware that some of you have an unhealthy reverence towards me. And it's not appropriate. And I don't want to be taken out of context. I don't want to be used as an instigation for you to get into something that's going to hurt you. And I had no real direct reason to be blamed for it, whatever the outcome. Your results are entirely yours. And with this number of people now following me, it's extremely intimidating. I'm not, the, I'm not afraid to do it wrong. Okay, that, 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 That's not what this is. Clearly, I can still talk about it, and I'll talk about it tomorrow, what I think is going to happen. And, you know, my stuff doesn't stop working because there's more people following. It, it, that's, I'm not worried about more people learning how to do it, and they're going to change the algorithm. That's not how this is going to work. Okay, It's not going to stop working. It's never going to stop working. Here's your answer. It's never, ever, 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 ever going to stop working because it is the market. This is what the markets do. When the markets are no longer available to us to be traded, that's when you can't trust it or rely on it because nobody can do anything with it then. Trading is just not allowed anymore. Is there ever going to be a time for that to happen? I don't know, but look at the world in the last three years. Who the fuck knows what's going to happen next? They're trying to do all kinds of crazy shit all the time. They have agendas they're trying to fulfill and get to, and at this point, nothing's off the table. But why worry about it? Because it might not ever happen in your lifetime, and you shit the bed and don't worry about it trying to pursue something and make your life better because you think it's going to stop working when you could have had five years of doing it and change it and set yourself up for life. You have selective hearing. Some of you don't want to succeed because you don't think you deserve it. And it's easier for you to justify some scenario in your head. You know, why bother? Because ICT is given you know, secret signals that the end of the world's coming so why bother learning how to trade I, I, it pisses me off when i see people do that when they comment like you know if you're saying that we're going to have all these problems and it's going to get harder you know why bother learning trading you know what block because i can't fix that mentality that's an ass backwards mentality that's a victimhood mentality okay until you can't drive this bitch forward you drive it till the brakes fall off that's how you do it Occupy until I come. That was his instructions, okay? I'm not going to get religious or spiritual here, but that was his instructions. Stay busy, okay? If you're, if you're just ready to be like, oh, well, you know, things are going to get harder. Why bother? Well, <laughs> that's why 99% of people stay working their job. They're too afraid to do anything. Not me. I'm not me, man. I was ready to quit every job I went into. If I knew I was going to find something better... Done. No two-week notice. Fuck you. Keep your job. I'm out of here. I will find something better. Until I figure out what I'm doing in my life, I'm going to not waste my time 
listening to people that are stupid as fuck that have a manager's title. Okay, I, I was managed by Carl's. That's where that whole idea comes from, Carl. Okay, there was a guy. <laughs> there was a guy that I worked for that literally was fucking stupid as shit. He had no idea what he was doing. It was a cl- he was a clown, but he acted like he knew everything. And upper management even talked down to him in front of us. But then he would turn around and talk to me and everybody else on my crew. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this shit. I'm out of here. He's still doing that job. Why is he still employed? Who the fuck knows? But he never improved. He never went up to upper management. And they weren't smart enough to fire his ass. And that's what most of you were going to be relegating yourself to. Don't make any change. Why bother? Change is scary. I might as well just eat the shit that they're willing to spoon feed me. At least I'm getting some of my bills paid. And I mean, I have the life I want, but it's acceptable enough for me now. Why would you accept that? You're worrying about something that might not happen in your lifetime. And you miss the opportunity to improve your life where you don't give a fuck what they're doing in this world. Yeah, I have a lot of money. And if they change the way money is done, which I think it might happen, it might happen in my lifetime. And my money becomes worthless. We could potentially become Venezuela 2.0 in the United States. It could happen. We could see it. But am I going to lose sleep and drive myself fucking crazy and just stop living my life because the potential's there? No, fuck no. I ain't worried about that. That means you're not living. You're, you're, you're just waiting to die. That's not, that's not what I want to do. And if you think that way, oh, well, why bother? Then don't listen to anybody, not just me. Don't listen to nobody. Just sit around and wait to fucking die. Just sit down there and wait, and th- wait to die. And just accept it. Greet it with warm hug. Because that's a victimhood mentality. I don't cultivate that here. I kick you in your ass, tell you exactly what it is. I don't sugarcoat anything. You're going to work very hard to learn how to do this. And the folks that get there, they know that they worked their ass off to get it. And no one can tell them they didn't earn it. But you're not going to come in here and waltz through with a, you know, a shortcut and somehow find your way to the front of the line. I've never sold that idea. I've promised that you're going to have to do a whole lot of things you're uncomfortable doing. Defer a lot of instant gratification that you think is owed to you. But you're trying to avoid it by overexposure, doing more than is necessary. I was very pleased to see some of the individuals that are now implementing what I've been talking about the last couple weeks, which is I gave you a challenge to trade with uh, one micro account. On one micro contract. And the, the point was, is you would s- discover fear of missing out is no longer an issue. Fear of holding on to a trade or getting stopped out is no longer an issue. Performance anxiety about how much you have to make goes away over time because if you can start making 50 bucks a day, if you could just make $50 a day, some of you that are in Africa, literally, that would take away a lot of your problems, lots of your problems. If you could just do that once a week, a lot of your problems would go away. But you see me, you see my students and other people showing tens of thousands of dollars, and you think that this is the only way to view success. And you subscribe to the problem in this industry, and which is permeated with by you know, male theology. It's dick measuring. It's really what it is. And I hate to be crude, but that's exactly what this is. Okay, when somebody looks at somebody and says, "Oh, well, you know, you only did this, but this is what I did." Okay, show the whole fucking year, not one day, where you did something nice and you gave her a smile. Okay, show the whole year what you deposited and what you're left with that's called a 1099b okay that's funny how you don't see that shit in the industry but they want to show you a screenshot on mt4 or show you one broker statement that's three pages long which means they over fucking traded and only made 60 fucking bucks on average per contract yeah that's anemic You worry about all the wrong things and don't press enough on the things that I tell you you should be. 
If you do the work on the areas I tell you to focus on, most of the problems that you're going to find that most other traders go through, and you won't avoid either, but you'll go through it sooner, it'll be less painful, but it still has to be done. If you do the things I tell you to do and avoid the things I tell you to avoid, you'll get through it sooner. But I'm not promising you speedily through it. But the shortest distance between one place to another is a straight line. And some of you want to do this roller coaster up and down and distraction. And now I'm going to try this. He's got something coming out next month. He's got a new model. I can't wait for his books because I'm going to drop everything I've learned so far. And I'm going to do whatever he tells me in this book. Who's at fault when you don't get there? You. Who's... Credit is it when you get there, yours. I'm just a conduit. I'm just the person that's relaying the information. But if you don't listen to good advice that's sound, I'm not telling you to go out there and risk money. I'm telling you these are times when I'm not trying to do it with my own. What is that communicating? Does that communicate that this is going to be an easy market? ICT is going to just go out there and, and slap it around. He's going to come out here and just show this and show that and show this. No, I, I'm aware that this is going to be problematic. And if given to my own devices, I'm prone to show humanity that I expose myself in as a 20-year-old where I'm frail. And I will get angry if I do it wrong. I want to do it again. So I spent time over the last 30 years identifying where those circumstances manifested itself. And what characteristics did it, did it have that I can identify going into a new week or a new trading day where I can anticipate this unfolding again so I can avoid it? If there's a pitfall there, if there's a snare or quicksand, uh, you know, something that's going to cause me to stumble, I want to know about it in advance. I don't want to blindly walk into a dark room with sharp objects pointing at me and run into it full steam. And that's exactly what some of you are wanting to do. And then surprised why you got your ass impaled. I don't know how that happened. Good grief, man. I'm never going to win this stuff. It's rigged against me. None of this stuff works. I see pizza fraud. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the short, that's the short cycle of most of the people that come to me, and they don't do it right. They try to rush through it. And that's the, that's the common consensus at the end. When they've done everything wrong. They've done everything wrong, and they didn't do the things I told them to focus on. But it's interesting when the folks that put the work in, the real work, the real work is for you to stay diligent doing the things I tell you to focus on. Because once you get that data behind you and you have all of this exposure to looking for it in old data where you can't weigh it out, where it's a report card for you as a pass or fail, a profit or a loss. It's you conditioning yourself, seeing something. That repetition of looking at it, this is what it looks like in hindsight, over and over and over again. In the first time I ever mentioned the fair value gap, you didn't understand it. You're thinking, what makes that a fair value gap? Like, it wasn't easy to see it, even though it is the easiest visual representation of a PDRA. It's the easiest thing to see. But now, by contrast, you look at a chart, if someone's chart gets put up on, on social media or you watch another YouTuber that doesn't do anything that we do and they're looking at charts and, and they point up a chart and they have whatever the fuck they put on their chart. It could be indicators, no indicators. It doesn't matter. But your eye will immediately jump right to that fair value gap. And it's amazing how they don't even fucking talk about it. And there's a trade right when it trades into it. They don't talk about it. It starts moving and then they say, wow, you know, this, is, this is a nice run right there. Look at that big rip right there. But you saw that coming. How did that happen? By conditioning yourself, looking at old data, back testing, studying it, logging it, journaling it, annotating it. That way it means something to you. And you sugarcoat it with commentary like you saw it live. You're training your subconscious. You're tricking your brain as a pseudo experience, as a, mom a moment or a memory that did not physically happen, but you're Basically, it's like, like a self-hypnosis, self exactly what it is. You're conditioning your subconscious to see that as a memory that you experienced real time. And you're shielding all the negative and you're sugarcoating it with your commentary. 
and you do this every day for months, by default, when you're watching real-time price action and you're tape reading, that means you're not pressing a demo, you're not doing a combine challenge, you're not pressing a button with a live account, you're not trading a funded account. You're just simply observing price action and you're watching it and you're seeing, does it behave like you would expect? Where there's no monetary result that's going to be detrimental or impactful in a positive sense at all because you're not pressing the button. You will start seeing that you can read the price action real time. And you need to do that for months. Once you're consistently able to do that, Unless you can do that part and you can see what these moves are going to do and you can see when price runs begin where it should not go past this point at this point here and it should reach up here. Why the fuck are you touching a demo account? If you can't do that, why are you – don't even reset the account. Don't touch it. The only thing that that demo account is going to do is cause you to believe that you're ready to do something that you're not. And you're going to have selective memory about all the times that you didn't do it right and there's two or three times where it made – $50,000 with a 50 lot on gold and you took 16 entries don't even know why the fuck you did it but they're only off by one tick that makes me sick when I see MT4 guys doing that shit here's my gold trades today 50 lots and look at their entry prices they're off by one tick that means they're just doing a whole bunch of shit they're shotgunning it boom 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 no logic being employed and they're getting out just a couple points. But they're so fucking over leveraged. And they're doing all these multiple entries. Start paying attention. Don't Everybody wants to look at that number on the right hand side. There's blue numbers showing the money. That's fake. They don't buy shit with that. They're not paying taxes on that. But that gives them a rise. It makes them feel good because someone gives them a like and now they got a dopamine hit. That's what they're trading that demo account for because they don't have any fucking skill. They ain't going to make any money off of it. They are getting the reaction that makes them feel significant on social media. These are social media people. They're not traders. They're getting their scratch and itch off of that interaction. And you're being inspired thinking, wow, if I could just do that, but they're not doing anything. And you avoid the real work that's required to make those real numbers. Or you can withdraw that kind of fucking money and spend it. Make a change in your life. Impact your family tree. Start doing things on the positive. But you're not going to get there overnight. And you're going to have you're going to have times in the market where it kicks your fucking ass. And you got to go home with whelps, bruises, contusions, concussions, maybe. And when you blow your account. It just, it just puts you in a coma. That's all. Until you get enough more scratch to get in there and reset that account and re-up re it again. It's just a fucking trading coma. Not every coma is terminal. Until you get the scratch to put back in your account, then you're in a coma. But people that want to trade, blowing an account ain't going to stop that. They have a tenacious spirit within them, and it's required. Not required that you blow your account or accounts, but the tenacity to know that even if you fuck it up, even if you do something wrong and you habitually do it wrong in the beginning, that's not a terminal outcome for you as a trader. It just means that you have a lot of opportunity to fix. But so many of you are walking around with, the, with your hands like blinders on, pretending that you're not doing those things to yourself. And you're only focusing on the good stuff, but you're not identifying the areas to, to improve on. When you journal, you sugarcoat yourself, but you have to be conscious to the things that you're repeating that are problematic. You don't record those negatively in your journal. You make observations, and you work towards removing the opportunities for those things to be invited into your trading or your progress. While you're going through the motions of learning how to trade, you want to keep the stimuli at a minimum. Social media is not the best thing for that. It's the worst thing. You're going to get people giving you influence about why you're wasting time doing this. Their shit's supposed to be better, and they're fucking blowing their accounts out. They're fucking cherry-picking their, you know, their successes, but they're not willing to show you everything. And because you're toxic, because you can't find success, it's easier for you to jump on somebody else's opinion about me or anyone else's that may have helped other people because you're hurting, and misery loves company. 
I'm, yeah, I, I subscribe to that view because I feel like I had a bad day and this feels good to bitch about something else besides myself. Put fault on somebody else. But guess what? You can't do that. In trading, you own every bit of it. Nobody puts you in your trades, but you did. You did it. I think you never said buy or sell. Tom, Dick, and Harry mentorship. They might want to tell you to even buy and sell and where the stop loss should be if they even use one. I don't do that here. I teach you how to reprice, trust yourself and your own analysis, and then when you do it the right way, you'll know that moment. You'll know that moment when you are absolutely comfortable going in and assuming real risk. You'll never need to ask me. You'll know. It won't be overconfidence. It'll be sheer boredom that you know that once you start doing this, you're going to make money. You won't be perfect. You'll have losing trades, but that losing trade will not change your mind about what you're doing. Your model still works. But see, you're not taught to think that way. This industry doesn't teach it. It doesn't do that at all. It's get rich quick. Push your edge. When you don't have an edge in the beginning. So if you have a dull edge and you're pushing it, how can you expect to carve out profitability? You can't. And a dull knife is dangerous. I said, I said it correct. A dull knife is dangerous. You're expecting it to do something, perform a function, and when it doesn't do it, you can get injured from it. But a sharp knife that's in the hands of someone that knows how to use it and respects its instrument. It's a safe instrument, but in the hands of someone that's not experienced with it, they themselves and anyone else around them can be harmed. It's maturity. It's, ob it's objectivity. And you need to know, knowing where you're going to be in trouble. How do you do that? Experience. How do you get the experience? Doing the things I tell you. Avoid the things I tell you not to do. Journaling. Allow for the experience to take root. And that experience will lift you like a feather. It'll carry you through these times where everybody else is going to be like, man, I missed these moves. Or I lost my account chasing this, but this is the move I should have saw coming. There's a lot of regret right now on social media over this week. A lot of people in our community that killed it did real well. But there's some people in there that said, I wish I wouldn't have traded and that hurts me because I, I do go out of my way to point to times when even in my own trading, admittedly, I'll have less precision because of the climate that we're in. It's, it's more likely to be heavily manipulated. You don't think for a moment, for, for just for the sake of discussion here, okay, with everything that's going on, and the profit that's made in war, you don't think that they're actively engaging and trying to keep it, all this stuff going? We are calling on Israel to not do the ground invasion. Don't do the. They may say that on the surface, but they're secretly wanting all that to happen and more because they're going to fucking profit off of it. Wartime machines make billions of dollars. And whenever there's a problem, Final card they use is war. I said all this stuff in the summer of 2016. Everything that's happening right now, they're following the same MO. It's the same process they do all the time. And you don't want to believe there's an algorithm. You honestly think that their whole structure and their whole financial empires, that they kill presidents and leaders and put other people in so that way you can have a central bank in that country. But there's no algorithm. There's no manipulation. There's no control where they're going to let their empire be at the control and risk of a group of speculators. <laughs> Man, that's some fucking, that's some religion right there. <laughs> oh, man, it's rich. That's so good. You really think that they're not going to have things in place to control how far it can go and when it's going to go where they want it to. They do so much to make sure that they can put a central bank in any country of their choosing. But they don't run. 
They don't run the markets. <laughs> Come on, man. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> you drank the Kool-Aid. You, you, re you really have fallen for it. I get it. I know. It completely upsets the whole thing, and you'll be viewed as a as a weirdo, some kind of a zealot and nutcase and conspiracy theorist. Funny thing about conspiracy theorists, they tend to be pretty accurate. They're all, they're, what the other uh, conspiracy theories, I was saying this the other day to my son, I said, you know what? I told you UFOs are going to be a thing, and now they're all over the place. And uh, you know, now the government came out and said it, and they brought those fake-ass alien bodies <laughs> Mexico brought them. They're fucking fake. Come on. Then they got Bigfoot caught. I don't know if you saw it, but in Arizona, some couple was riding on a train. <laughs> and then there comes Bigfoot walking in and he sits down. He's watching the train go by. So there's, there's footage of Bigfoot. So what are we missing now? The fucking Loch Ness Monster. I'm waiting for it. Someone's going to have Loch Ness Monster. Okay. They're going to have video footage. <laughs> Because nothing else is left on the list of conspiracy theories, okay? Everything else has been checked off. All boxes have been checked. Simpsons, Call the Future, like everything. We are, Everything is a conspiracy until it's not. So, I get it. You won't be accepted in your circle of friends and influences. And if you're in the financial industry, you know, you, you, you're not going to be able to talk about an algorithm running everything. Because they're going to like, what are you talking about, dude? You know, we went to school, we learned this, they put us through this and that. Right. Because you have an image to uphold. I don't have an image to uphold. Image is bullshit. What is the, uh, the slogan for Sprite? Image is nothing. Obey your thirst. And I thirst after excellence. I'm not going to drink their bullshit. I'm not going to fall victim to their bullshit shenanigans. Early on, I did. But when you finally understand how all this stuff works, it's liberating. It's scary, and you think about how uncomfortable it is thinking like this, and now everybody else doesn't think this way. And if you're weak-minded, they'll beat you and make you feel like what you're thinking isn't real because they need their shit. They need their illusion to be maintained. Otherwise, it, question, it brings into question their whole existence and their, their whole paradigm. False. But when you take a step back and say, okay, look, you're sitting in the house and you're talking to your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend, somebody else that's in there with you, and you start talking about something. And then all of a sudden, your fucking phone starts throwing advertisements on the very thing that you just talked about. Now, years ago, when it first started happening, people were like, this must mean the universe is telling me I need to buy this. Because look at this. It just keeps coming up. Or for some of you, God must want me to buy this. This is the solution. When it's just a fucking algorithm, listening to you on a device that you paid for, and it's eavesdropping, and it's controlling you. It's inspiring you to spend money that you probably can't afford to spend for shit that you don't need, that nobody's going to give a fuck about that you own. But you want to buy it because you want to impress people that you don't like. But there's no algorithm in the market. <laughs> oh, there's some good shit, man. <laughs> Come on. Really. It, it, it is mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling that they would risk the, the, the <laughs> everything they've worked for. All the control. All the vast richness and wealth and empire that they've created, and they wouldn't have mechanisms in place that cause how markets go up and down, how far they'll go, when they'll go, time everything. Time it all. And they don't have to worry about it. It's controlled. It's scripted. And it's such a hard thing for you to, to swallow when I'm proving it every single week. <laughs> No, oh, it, it's fun. It's it's fun to see so many people resist it because deep down inside they're thinking if that's real, everything that I've lived is a lie. Everything that I believed in 
is false. And I've been led astray and deceived. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly what has taken place. That's the truth. Deception. That's what's been running rampant. Information has exploded. Everybody can see it now. And when these things start amp amping up and, and really accelerating, you honestly believe that your social media is going to be acceptable and allowed? Nope. Internet is going to be killed. When, this, when we lose internet connection, it's because the real shit's hitting the fan. And they do not and will not allow cell phone, telephone, or internet. E email won't happen. Instant message won't happen. Social media updates won't happen. Even Telegram won't happen. Then you know you're in the shit. That's when shit is really hitting the fan. Because they're not going to allow coordination. The sharing of information so uh, we other people can make themselves ready. And that's not fear mongering. That's just the, that's the reality. And until that day comes and that unfolds, I'm doing whatever the fuck I'm doing normally. I'm not hiding up in my house. I'm going out. I'm shopping. I'm spending time with my family. I'm going to restaurants. I'm doing whatever the fuck I want to do. I'm not living in fear. Neither should you. But you need to be aware that there is the strong likelihood that there may be some destabling things occurring in the United States. If you think all these people that have been coming in, all these war-aged males coming through our border, they're all here just to have the good life? No. We have, in, we have a, a, this, this perspective in, in, in America where you know, we're king shit. We're the police of the world. Everybody fears us. Nobody can touch us. Nobody could ever invade us because we have two coasts in this town. That's bullshit. Every time I've heard anybody say that, like that's nonsensical. And ever since they've allowed our southern border open, and some of you are like, oh, here we go. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stop listening now because we're doing it. I'm just telling you like it is because all of this is what's impacting my decisions about the marketplace, what's going to cause destabilization, what would catalyst, what would be the catalyst for the disruption to the marketplace. Let me tell you what's going to happen. These people that came through our southern border, they just added to what was already here. And when it's go time and these people are in, in, instigated, their, their little button has pushed for their operations to begin. What happened when a couple airplanes were flown into some buildings and crashed in a field in Pennsylvania and a missile hit the Pentagon? I mean, a plane. Hit the Pentagon. Everything stopped. The whole world changed that day. Everything changed that day. Where they can say, you're a terrorist. So therefore, you don't have any right to attorneys. They can imprison you, and you can rot in jail. And there ain't a fucking thing anybody can do about it. Hmm. Where's the Constitution? Where's the Bill of Rights? They've wiped their ass with it. Obama made a 100-mile new constitution zone around the U.S. Most of you don't even know about it. But that's what's happened. That means there's no constitution, no protection, 100 miles from the coast into our country. Who the fuck is he to say that? Our founding fathers are rolling in their fucking graves right now. They would have already started shooting <laughs> Years ago. And these people that are in our country right now, they're just waiting. They're not here to integrate. They're going to be the army that's already here. We have been invaded. No, no planes have to come over here. No missiles need to be shot. What do you think would happen if, say, oh, I don't know. A band of 10 to 15 well-trained 
unconventional warfare type folks start doing some things in your city, in your state. Crippling. Crippling. Grid could be neutralized like that. It's fragile as shit. Communications, gone. Water supplies, poisoned. You think the stock market's going to trade then? No. You think airplanes will be flying around? No. You think you're going to be allowed to cross borders in, from state to state? Nope. You think they're going to have an election if all that stuff's going on? Hell no. Nope. No war machine needs to come here. Everything's in place. It's chess. It's been chess since 9-11. And they're not going to go backwards. Everything is controlled. Everything is manipulated. It's absolutely falling into their schedule. And all these little puppets and muppets they put in, in governors and Senate seats and Congress, White House, they're just pawns for the period of time they can be used. And they're cast aside. They're paid All this shit is coming home to roost soon. And if you're not preparing yourself mentally for it, it's going to cause so much anxiety and fear, which is unfortunate because if you know what's likely to come, you're not going to be surprised by it. You can't stop it. The only thing you can do is make your house as, as ready as you can. And with preparation, having experience, Another means of having income, you might lose your job with all the things. It, what happens if, if, if terrorism breaks out? Okay. What happens if um, another nation has people in our country right now, and I'm not going to name anyone in particular because it could be anyone really, and they start going door-to-door -door neighborhoods? Well, we're a different kind of country. <laughs> yeah, most families, most homes – have things in them that other countries don't. So we have the largest fucking army, okay? And it's in the citizenry of our citizens. Like, literally. Of all the countries that want to try to do something like what was happening over in Israel, that would be a big fucking mistake trying that here. Because we, we don't need to see you try to do it in a small town. It's any town USA. Any town USA, fuck around and find out. Because, yeah, there might be a lot of people killed here. And it, it might happen like that. But the success rate <laughs> by ratio is not going to be the same. And the only thing that would happen here is it becomes fucking deer season in the U.S. Whatever people, whatever group, whatever nation they would come from, they would be driving around on their fucking hoods of their pickup trucks, strapped down like a deer, showing everybody... We're all rednecks now. We're all rednecks now. There's a lot of people in this country. They're chomping at the bit. They want stuff like that to pop off here. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to use any of the things that I have. But I will. But I don't want those things to happen. I'm not fearful that they're going to happen. But I made my house and my family and myself ready for it. And in the event it happens, that's the best you can do, right? But I'm not fearful. I'm not losing sleep over that shit. That's what it's designed to do. Fear is a controlling factor. And when you have experience and you have protocols and processes in your trading, it lifts you like a feather. You rise and float above all the other shit that people are going to be wrestling with. That they'll lose their account. They'll blow their account. They'll try to do things recklessly and push more in an environment that's not conducive for that to be profitable. You have to identify where these snares are. And there's no easy way for me to teach it except for when it appears, when it's there, I tell you real time, this is what it is. And then I do the best to, to, to teach in that environment. But sitting still should not be avoided. If you don't know something, if you know that there's an increased risk, 
Be still. It's safe. It's okay. I mentioned deer season a little while ago. You know, where I live at in Hartford County, there's, there's deer all the time. And you have to be careful driving around early morning hours and late evening hours because they're, you know, they're like long-legged rats. They're, they're, they just walk out in front of you sometimes. And if you're going on a road, you, know, you can destroy your car, hurt you if it goes through the windshield. It's unfortunate. But sometimes you'll catch them with their little, little young one, a little fawn. And to see them when they see a man or a car or something like that, the little one, it will see its mom. And no words are spoken. You, you, they're not talking, right? They don't make any sound. They, they just, I can't hear them. Maybe if someone that knows more about it can say something in the comment section. I'm trying to reply. But it's like the mother looks at the little one, and all of a sudden the little one drops and lays flat. How did it learn that? Did the mother deer say, hey, drop down like that? It's instinct. It knows preservation is the first rule. So survival is, is you know, I, I have to hide. Be still. But in this industry, it's, oh, there's danger. Let me run right at it because that's where the action is. This is where all the money's made. And you don't have the skill. You don't have the... You don't have to pedal a bike without the training wheels on, but you're going to go out there in the time and the setting, the climate in which there's the, the highest probability of manual intervention where they're going to clean the books, both sides, up, down, up, down, up, down. But you're going to call it readiness that you want to go out there because it's, this is the best time to be trading. These are a lot of volatility. There are lots of volatility doesn't always equate to high probability and profitability. There's a high probability you're going to lose your ass. I've seen eight instances where if I was in front of the charts live, I would have done it wrong. And I can tell you that I'm comfortable having sat still till Friday. I feel good about not having done anything until Friday. Now, if I were to talk about the instances that I have lived through and blowing accounts, that's the reality, folks. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating any of this shit. I'm telling you, fuck around and find out. Don't listen to this logic, and you'll repeat what I did. You need to learn those lessons. You need to lose your account to learn to appreciate what I'm sharing with you. You have to find out on yourself. You got to go through it. You got to get that scar tissue. You got to be part of the club. Look at this. I got it too. You, that this shit tore me up. I'm I'm a warrior now. You're better than me if you don't go through it. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of why I'm teaching you like this. So that way you don't have to go through it. So even my own kids want to do the same shit. Uh, well, you know, the only way I'm going to learn that is to go through it. Well, you know, the teacher in me is trying to spare all of you. You don't need to do this. I am of the mindset that if someone was teaching the way I'm teaching, and I would have blew my first account when I was 20. If I would have had access to this information, I would not have traded probably for the first two years after that. I would have worked very, very hard to be very systematic about it. And some of you think that, that you would never do that. There ain't no way I'm going to wait two years to take a trade. But you're willing to go into fucking debt to learn a career that you don't even know if you like. Going to college. And they convince you that this is the best way to live your life. This is the right way. Get a career. Get a, get a trade. How do you know you like it? You don't. You don't like it. I was making my own code and games with basic language in sixth grade. Then when I was going to college to learn more about coding, I fucking hated it. I hated it. I hated it then. But when it was for me, I loved it. You don't know what it's going to be like for you. You're going to school. You'll be a doctor. Oh, it's great. You know, I'm learning how to be a doctor. I love the learning aspect of being able to help other people. And you get out there and you realize, shit, this industry is so backwards. 
They don't really want me to help anyone. They don't really want me to heal anyone. It's all about making fucking money. And I have a solution, but if I try to do the solution, I'm going to lose my fucking license to practice medicine. Oh, hello. How can you love doing it then? I have students that are in that situation. COVID pulled that pulled all that shit out from underneath them. And they're like, wow. It was shocking. It was shocking to hear the testimony of the experiences that they as trauma surgeons, frontline doctors, discovering what they went into this field for, they couldn't do. They couldn't help people. And trading was the, the, the last solution because they couldn't do that anymore. Do you think that they regretted all the things that they had to go through to learn that skill set now? No. They're thankful. Your perception is constantly being molded and shaped, and you don't realize it. If you watch TV, that's, that's why they call it TV programming. They're programming your opinion how you think critically about the things they want you to think about and avoid and ignore the things that they don't want you paying any attention to. The same thing happens in the marketplace. There's economic calendars. It's just like TV programming. We expect manipulation then. We have to have an expectation of where to think the market's going to go. We have to have an idea of who can be wrecked here today. And how could they make them trust to put money in that situation where it could be maximized? And then once it does that, then we can go and look for a set that the real trade is going to form afterwards. I've never read a book coming up that gave that logic. It never happened. But because I went into the marketplace looking at my own failures, how was I failing? What was I utilizing? What was I subscribing to mentally? What did I see in the chart and have every bit of faith in? What did I not see coming? The only way I've seen these things is by having a record of making observations. See, so the way most of you are doing this right now, if you don't journal, is you have a winning trade, you win, great. You go on social media, champion it, trophy it out, woohoo, dog and pony show. You're losing trades, you're, you're taking a day off of social media. <laughs> you're doing something else that day. But you're upset, you're, you're, you're angry, you're regretful, but you're not looking into what you did wrong. You're trying to hide it, trying to sweep it under the rug. That's not what you're supposed to do. And you put all the emphasis on what you did right and you made money. They're not going to learn anything from what you made money on except for ego and pride. And that's just going to make you harder to learn the, from the mistakes because you're going to try to hide those things that were painful. Because you want the sugary coatedness of the wins. And you think that the wins are going to teach you everything you need to know about winning and making money. And it's not. The way you learn how to make money is you study what you did wrong. And you put things in place to fortify the errors that you made and created. You fortify that with positive things that re remove the likelihood and invitation for those things to repeat in the future. But that takes work, and it takes the time and energy to identify that you have a frailty. You have a weakness there. But that weakness is going to remain there until you remove it. Don't pretend it's not there. Don't pretend. That's why marriages and relationships fail too. You see problem areas. You see weak links in that relationship. You see early morning signs that this, pro this person could potentially start becoming someone you really don't want to be with. So you need to address it early on. Say, hey, look, um, when we got together, this is – I didn't see this about you. Is this something that we need to work on together, or is this something that, you know, this is who you are, and I have to make a decision? Because you don't want to be in a toxic relationship. And trading can become a toxic relationship. Where you build this codependency with a toxic lover, which is what the market is, she is a cruel, and it's not in deference to the ladies being vilified, okay? You, if you want to call it, he's a cruel lover for you know, the folks that are looking at it like that way, that's fine too. But 
the markets are a very cruel lover. They demand all of our attention. They're jealous. They don't like it when we spend time with our family. How do you have proof of that? When you're spending time with your family, the fucking market will go 500 fucking points. And you should have been in front of charts. And now you weren't. So go fuck yourself. I paid you for uh, your, uh, your, your disloyalty. You want to spend time with me? You want to spend time with them? Okay. Here's a, here's a missed opportunity. And then you're going to come back the next day thinking, oh, it's going to be another 500 handle on. And then <laughs> hit you in the stomach. Lose more money. Cruel lover, man. So it's, it's a very, very hard industry to master through the emotions and psychological balancing act. And if you have children, you have just literally made this so more complex. You've made it so astronomically difficult because if you're a parent, and for some of you young folks that don't have children yet, this is going to be a discovery for you. Okay? But when you're a parent, you are wrestling with guilt constantly. I'm spending too much time in these charts, but I need to make money because I want to make something better for them in their life. And you're constantly doing this balancing act. And if you're trying to be a teacher and you're trying to run some kind of a business and trying to teach and help other people, you're basically putting other people up in front of your own children. And that guilt is always there. But know the surface, it's always there. And it's nagging and eating at you, consuming you. And that's going to cause you to do things that are reckless. You want to hurry up and get through something to be able to throw a bone to, to your students or throw a bone to your clients or throw something out there to you know, keep people inspired because you have to do more in the scope of a father or mother for your children. You have that responsibility. And when you are young and you live vicariously and recklessly and doing things because you're, you're, you're new money now, and you're not responsible, and you create a new being, a new life, and a child, that's wonderful if you stay with them, and, and, and that becomes a relationship, and you're a family element. That's wonderful. Be fruitful and multiply. It's great. But what happens if it wasn't like that? You have now made your life and their life so complicated because you didn't plan your actions. You, didn't, you weren't responsible. All these things are... a a response to being not equipped to assume the risks. You didn't follow a process or a protocol. And you are just reacting to the circumstances. Oh, wow, they want to lay down with me? Oh, well, I'll do that. And now, yeah, that's what happened with me. My oldest son, Cody, that was exactly what it was. I had new money. I was attracted to his mother. I didn't know she was married. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm a daddy. Gold digger. We're going to take you for everything you got. Well, I wasn't ready for that. Who would be? And when you flash your money and you flash your lifestyle, you're putting a billboard sign. Come take advantage of me. Both sexes. Come take advantage of me. You don't think it can happen to you guys? Or gals? Look at Reba McIntyre. Look at Kelly Clarkson. They got gold diggers. <laughs> And it happened to them. More money, more problems. So when you start making money, the worst thing you can do is go on social media and tell everybody what you're doing. Because you're going to have ambulance chasers constantly coming around looking for an opportunity. I got people all the time on the road, literally. If I'm in my vets, I got assholes that run up real quick, and it would look like, oh, they want me to race, or they want me to launch it. They want me to take off. Or they're just toying with me. They just you know, look at me and smile like, yeah, I, I can't beat you, that type of thing, because they're running riding little rice burners and bullshit. But what they do is they run up real quick, and they hurry up and jump in front of me and slam the brakes on. I'm already expecting it. That's a scam. They want me to rear-end them in my Corvette and then claim back injury and disability for the rest of their fucking life. That's exactly what it is. So I drive with every expectation giving lots of room in front of me. My wife doesn't do this, and that's why I don't like her driving my cars. She has her own car and her own policy. And I keep it that way because she drives recklessly. She drives aggressive. She drives on people's bumpers. Like, she's, she's nuts. I don't like to drive with her. But she keeps so little distance between the car in front of her 
in her front bumper, she doesn't let that opportunity present itself. But what she doesn't realize is she's riding on the person that may be that kind of person that says, okay, well, I'm just going to put the brakes on and then I got you. So every risk that's out there, you know, there's someone that has more experience that would have saw these things coming. And as a mentor, I try to convey that. It may not be an analogy that makes sense to you. It may not be so um, apparent, the lesson that I'm trying to draw from for you as an audience member listening. You might be too young to appreciate some of the things I talk about, and you, older folks can say, yeah, you know, I, you, you, you're, you're spitting facts. Right, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's exactly how I would have said it if I were you. But there, you're, not all of you are going to be able to relate to the things I'm teaching or the way or teaching style because your youth is in the way, just like my youth was in my way. But over time, given enough experience, that experience will lift you like a feather. It'll carry you above all these problem times. When it's problematic and you're going to likely do it wrong, your experience will, will tell you, this is where you're going to probably do it wrong. So don't bother. Take a, take a couple days off. Demand that it does something exceptional where it's really confirming that what you were expecting is likely to occur. That's not weakness. That's not not knowing how to trade and other people are going to be able to say, I did this and I did that. It's so funny. Just look at the last two years. The people that talk the most, every time they put their fucking foot in their mouth, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to prove ICT this. And, and they look like fucking fools. And I'm staying in my own lane just doing what I'm doing. They're wrecking themselves because they're trying to use social media the wrong way. And it comes into backfires. Just like some of you that are young, you want to be able to present your funded account, certified funded account trader, your withdrawal, because you need other people to believe you. Because you can't believe your own success. That to me is astonishing. I'm not saying every one of my students or anybody else's students that share their accolades and success and their withdrawals and profits that they've made and their success and milestones, not all of them need that. But largely, most of them do. Because you can't believe that it's happened to you until other people acknowledge it. And that's a sad state of affairs because that's what our humanity's become. We've been beaten down to think that working too much all week long to make too little money, starving ourselves from family attention and time with them, calling that the American dream, calling that a success story, that anything apart from that that's profitable feels like a dream. And we have to be pinched to be reminded that this really happened. You really did make money. You really did call the future. It panned out like you thought it was going to happen. You did what they said is impossible. You timed the market. You did it exactly like you were supposed to. It bent its knee to you, and you made money. I get it. You, you, it's hard to believe it. And that's why a lot of people around you, when you go on social media – they're not going to believe you. It's normal. So why invite the opportunity where you have to defend yourself? Don't do it. Live in your life privately. Make all the money you want to make. Don't flaunt it. Don't invite people that want to try to take it from you undeservingly. And don't invite them in their fucking unsolicited opinions. That doesn't mean fuck all. Because if you're doing it, it matters not what anybody else thinks. Who cares what they think? Are you going to change your spending habits when you start making six figures a year based on somebody else's opinion that you did or didn't really make that money? <laughs> no. No, you're not. You're not going to give a shit. And you're just making them significant by entertaining them. I sport with these people online because Twitter's fun to me. It's, it's, it's always been a playground for me. My advice when I leave is... Don't waste your time with it. it, it there's too many things going on in the world. It, it, it's better usage of your time doing it away from social media. Pour all of your attention and development. Be balanced. Work on having a balanced life. That's where I failed. I failed having a balanced marriage and fatherhood over my children. I spent too much time in these markets. I've spent too much time since 2016 with all of you as my students. And that may sound rude, 
but I can't get that time back. And I feel terrible. I feel like I cheated my own children. 17, 18, 19 hour days running a mentorship. Trying to help people and trying to give everything I had. It affected my health. I couldn't sleep well. And you might think I don't sleep well because I do the sleep says all I have, but I couldn't sleep hardly at all. And sometimes you would hear me in the recordings and I'm you can hear I'm fatigued. I was getting sick more than I ever did because I don't I, I usually don't get sick. But I got sick several times while running a mentorship because my immune system was being affected by fatigue, not eating right, not exercising. I was constantly on the computers, constantly engaging students. And I'm excited in three weeks that I'm not going to have to have that level of output anymore. And I get to spend time through the holidays with my family and start a brand new year without having this tethering between all of you and me. And I'm going to be enjoying watching all of you grow and who gets to rise up and who gets all of the, the accolades and everybody wants to follow that person. I'm not going to be showing up and saying anything, talking shit about anybody else. I'm going to watch just like everybody else is watching. I want to see what you all do. I want to see the next person that gets all the bullshit and also all the attention and how they manage it, what they do with it. Do they abuse it? Do they monetize it? Do they whatever they do? I don't know. I'm interested to see it. Not for the dick measuring aspects of it, but I'm genuinely interested. But I don't have to spend my life on social media doing it. And that's what's unfortunate that since 2016, social media has controlled my life. It's absorbed the majority of my time. So for the folks that are, are upset with me that saying that I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't leave social media, I shouldn't leave being active because I have more people now that want to learn and it's not fair, go watch what I've already produced because that's what they did. Everybody that's got to the point where they're at right now, they watch what I produce. I didn't delete anything. It's there. Go through all that again. Well, not again, but go through it like they did. And anything you need to be fortifying or shoring up, just go back and watch it. That's why you should be writing notes, taking notes of what these videos are talking about. So that way you know, go back into that video at this time he talked about this. Anything that you feel unsure about, when you're watching a video and I comment on it, make a notation of where I talked about it. And when you start looking at a, a few different videos, I'll talk about something here in one video and I'll amplify it over here. And by having that and maybe another third or fourth video, you'll have a better understanding of what I did in those instances that are uniquely and separated from one another. But it'll give you the concept or conceptual idea of what it is I'm employing. And you'll have the, the visibility to be able to see, oh, I get that now, versus me trying to do one video teaching like a TGIF. You think every single weekly candle is going to retrace 20 or 30% because it's a Friday every week. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So there's logic that I shared in there that it, it's still in that video, but because you come in with these preconceived notions about what it is that you should know, well, that means that you're a teacher. You're not the student. If you're coming to me telling me how you need to be taught, that means you're the teacher, and I'm going to sit down. I'll let you teach yourself. And then when you're ready to learn, you'll stop pretending you know more about how you should learn. You don't know. You're in a state of ignorance when you come to a teacher, not just me, anyone. And you have to have modesty and respect that you're expecting these people that are not obligated. I'm not obligated to teach you fucking nothing. I love doing it. But I have had my feelings hurt being very interested trying to help some individuals. And they literally turn around and kick me in the face for doing the very thing that I would have done for anyone else and wish they would have done for me when I was coming up. But I'm not going to lie to you and tell you something that you want to hear that isn't going to help you. I'm going to tell you how you're going to fail, how to avoid it, 
These are the things you have to work towards, and it's going to be a struggle for some of you. Not all of you, but some of you are going to resist it. And the longer you resist it, that means it's, it's going to take you that much longer to learn how to do it consistently. With all of that said, these things that keep creeping into your trading development that are problems, it's the fact that you have not learned properly from the things that are being negative in your progress. And you're pretending they're not there. And you have to tackle them. You have to remove the invitation for them. You have to remove the setting, the, the opportunity. And the easiest thing that I can try to communicate to you is there are times when the market is going to be harder. And when you can identify that, it's best to not do anything. And it matters not if Joe Schmo and his mentorship horseship is made whatever he's supposedly made at a time when you maybe have made it public knowledge that you're not doing it because you don't think the market's going to be conducive for high probability trading. Whenever someone says that on social media, I guarantee you, when I say that stuff, the people that say that shit about me where I got multiple accounts and multiple laptops trying to buy and sell the same thing bullshit, <laughs> they themselves are working very, very hard to come up with something to say, ICT said, don't do this, but here's what I did. Because they need that to feel good about themselves. They need that significance. They need that dopamine hit. They need to be able to feel like they outsmarted me. That's not the wrong, that's not the right thing to do in trading. You're trying to constantly measure up to someone else. The people that make money don't give a fuck. I don't care what these people make or lose. I don't care. Their methodology, I don't believe in. It's mythology. It's, it's made up fairy tales bullshit. If they made money, that was chance. Just like when people go to casinos and they get lucky at the slot machines. It isn't skill. It's a ratio. At some point, after a certain amount of money goes in the machine, then it pays out a certain percentage. That's how it works. It's running on an algorithm. <gasps> oh, shit. <laughs> but by having a logic of knowing when to avoid certain things in certain climates, when not to trade, and when to put a limitation on yourself. I can only trade if it does this, and it's got to be rooted in sound logic. That will prevent you from wrecking yourself. It'll instill discipline, self-control, and you will not invite the tendency to over-leverage, over-trade, and revenge trade. And you won't fear missing any move. You've already given yourself permission. How, how disarming is that? Yeah, I already know that this is probably going to be a week where it moves around a lot, but I might not be that precise this week. So I'm willing to let it go, even if I don't take any trades all week long. You've done it outwardly, already committed it to it. You, you committed yourself to it, so that way you're not going to feel any regret. Because you've already told yourself, you've given yourself permission. How many times have you done that in your trading? You've given yourself permission to not take a trade this day. Even though you think it might do something, do you outwardly say to yourself, you know, Michael, you do have permission to not take a trade today. Nobody's expecting you to take a trade today. You don't have to trade today. That's what that does psychologically and subconsciously. It disarms you so that way you're not out to prove shit. Then your visibility becomes more clear. You'll see the setups that are really there versus I need to have something so I can go on social media. I need to do a live stream so I can show my bullshit working and then losing. It's human error constantly repeating itself over and over and over again, and they don't see it. You don't see it, and it's correctable. You can replace this methodology that invites failure. You can replace it by simply giving yourself permission to be imperfect, and you don't have to trade every day. And once you disarm yourself like that, your objectivity and looking at price it becomes clear. You don't have anything to prove. You're not out there trying to prove your concepts, my methodology, or whatever it is that you're doing works. You're just focusing on, is that setup really there? Does it fit what I'm expecting the market to do? And then what happens is you become a well-rounded, balanced, professional-minded trader. And by doing those things, by contrast, It'll lift you like a feather.
You'll just float above all these other problem times where everybody else is like, where the hell did that come from? Why was the market so hard this week? What this what this this market creating all these problems for? Why does it keep having all these deep retracements? You're not on social media laughing at them. You're not in there you know, kicking sand in your face, but you're smiling. I'm glad I didn't get caught up in that bullshit. You're wiser now. So stillness is a very, very good skill set. And the sooner you learn to give yourself the permission to be still, the better. So if you found something insightful today from this, hopefully I was inspirational in some aspect of sharing what it is that I felt inspired to talk about. I'm not tired, but I can hear my wife down here. She's getting aggravated with the puppy, so um, that's her way of letting me know it's time to come down here and help me. <laughs> so I'm going to wish you a very pleasant Saturday. Hopefully you enjoy yourself this weekend. You're safe and you're in good health. And I will be with you all tomorrow, Lord willing, at 5 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow to do a live stream market review. And then uh, we'll see what we do in the opening. So I'll stay with you for about an hour uh, tomorrow. Until I talk to you then.